Councillor Pringle. Present. Councillor Mackey. Councillor Barfoot. Present. Councillor Burley. Present. Councillor McQueen. Present. Warden Halliday. Present. Councillor Patterson. Present. Councillor Hicks. Here. Councillor Clumpus. Here. Councillor Greenfield. Present. Councillor Boddy. Present. Councillor Wright. Here. Councillor Fosbrook. Present. Councillor Woodbury. Present. Councillor McKean. Present. Councillor Ardell. In attendance. Councillor Eccles. Councillor And Councillor Bell. Present. Well, that's great. Everybody has their comments after they're, they're standing. Standing true to form. All right. Uh, point four on our agenda is a declaration of pecuniary interest. Anybody has one, they can declare it now or later on, as may be needed. If it's. So then the first order of business is the adoption of minutes. And uh, the first is that the minutes of county council meeting and committee of the whole meeting dated September the 13th, 2018, and the resolutions contained therein be adopted as, pre as presented. Put that on the floor, Councillor Hicks and Councillor Patterson. Discussion. Yes, Councillor McKean. Uh, thank you, Gordon Halliday. I just uh, wish to, uh, if we could have a discussion on PDR CW 18, or sorry, 2818, which is page eight of the uh, a package. Okay, page eight and uh, servicing allocation options report. Yes. Okay. You want to? You want to ask the question? Well, I guess that um, <clears throat> I, I have a bit, bit of a fair bit of concern regarding this, in that I read the report, uh, staff report, and I see that it was carried at the committee level, and I believe that this is a is a, um, a, a decision that will align the county with the developers and against the municipalities and so um, I would um, ask that uh, you know if there isn't any other discussion about it or any other comments that at least be a very I'll ask for a recorded vote on this particular section any any comments from staff on that or we just yes Thank you for the, the, the comments. Um, this is uh, um, what was passed, I guess, by, by Committee of the Whole was, or recommended by Committee of the Whole was um, uh, basically an option. Um, so municipalities will still have the option and the default will be that servicing will be allocated at the time of draft approval. Um, we heard from majority of municipalities um, indicating that that's their preference. Um, so that can be still status quo uh, for those misplays that want to um, choose exercising that option. If this uh, uh, report and motion were to be passed, misplays would have the option to allocate at a different time, uh, whether that, that be at, uh, at time of final approval um, through a bylaw. Um, and there are other municipalities um, in Ontario that do allow for servicing allocation at different times. County staff struggle with this because um, yeah, we don't we don't manage and operate um, the servicing uh, that's operated by municipalities. Uh, we wanted to provide as, as much flexibility in the options to municipalities in order to uh, address any servicing challenges that they're currently facing, allowing those municipalities to work with those developers in order to move forward with different options if the municipality chooses to do so. And that's the key point: is if the municipality chooses to do so. So that's where the, like I said, the default position will still be status quo in that uh, allocation will be allocated at the time of draft approval. However, municipalities would have the option uh, to allocate at a different time. So there it is. It's built in flexibility um, with options at the lower tier. So uh, I'll entertain uh, Councillor Frostbrook. Do you have any comments on that? Thank you, Mr. Warden. I do recall the discussion, and I certainly recall as well the discussion in relation to who is accountable should a municipality find themselves in a financial bind as a result of making commitments that they have not sourced out, RFP, tendered, all that good stuff the province wants you to do, 
before these decisions are premature as per the province. So there really wasn't a whole lot of clarity in our last discussion about the county's liability in supporting this uh, approach, if you will, and I too also have concerns. So I just thought I'd reiterate the ones that I made at the last meeting. Thanks for that input. Um, CEO, any comment on that or are you just? Again, I think the, the principle here is one of providing additional flexibility for those municipalities who choose to exercise that option. We are in no way um, assuming or um, requiring anyone to make a change from their current practice. So we don't anticipate any, any additional liability at the county level. It's, it's really the owner onus is on the lower tier and Cert it gives them flexibility. Absolutely. And I think certainly um, should any of our municipalities want to examine this option further, our staff would be sitting down with the appropriate support and, and legal advice to really examine the particular circumstances that municipality is in and looking at all sides of why they might contemplate moving in this direction. And really, I think, again, there would need to be quite a fulsome staff report coming forward to that member municipalities council to be able to make an informed decision. What we were trying to do here was to create an environment that enabled flexibility. And um, with this, we can then move forward. Thanks for that comment, Kim. Uh, John, you still have some? If, if I may just briefly okay. follow up. I'll, so, then I'll go back to John afterwards. So in this matter and in other related matters that we will get to throughout the fulsome agenda, mm -hmm. the recurring theme for me is accountability. And so where the, in my view, where, where, where the county takes a position on a certain issue, there is the risk that the municipality is going to interpret that as, oh, well, you know, the county said it was okay and therefore it must be okay. I think it needs to be really clear what's at stake and who is accountable. Thank you. To me it's clear, but anyhow, uh, um, John. Uh, uh, thank you. I guess that, um, you know, in the past, you know, the county always was uh, watching over the municipality as far as, you know, allocation of, of sewer and water capacity and, you know, we're another set of eyes in, in the case that, uh, um, you know, the municipality was starting to reach its maximum for, the, for those facilities. And those facilities cost tens of millions of dollars to, to expand. And I think that it was ju just the, uh, I don't know whether to use the word peer review of what you had for development as opposed to what uh, your capacity was, but I, I don't think that it uh, has uh, hindered any development in, in Gray County that I'm aware of. And I'm just wondering why that with that uh, oversight that with at the county level, why would we be uh, wanting to uh, abandon that? And even as I said, I know we take Randy's uh, comments about it's an individual decision. I'm sure that you're going to have some developers are going to take this and say, okay, well, the county doesn't have any problem with you if you're getting close to your, your allotment of uh, water and sewer and, and use this actually against the municipality. So that's, I still uh, I have requested the recorded vote on this. Thank you. Okay, fine. That's, uh, that's acceptable. So uh, we'll pull this. Uh, All right. So... Uh, yeah, here's a resolution, uh, Councillor McKean, that resolution CW218-18 be, be pulled from the September 13th, 2018 Committee of the Whole Minutes and be voted on separately. Uh, moved by Councillor McQueen, seconder. McKean. Hmm? Councillor Frostbuck, you're seconder. Okay, so that's pulled. All right. <coughs> Right. Okay. So uh, we'll take a uh, we'll take a vote on that, and uh, the the clerk. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. I would also like to um, talk about uh, PDR CW thirty one eighteen, the Meaford Winery Official Plan Amendment uh, Merit Report. What I, page is that on? Uh, that was uh, page ten. Ten. Sorry. Yes. Ten. You want that pulled, or what? You want, what's oh, your... Okay, pull it then, and then I can speak to it. Thank you. 
you want to uh, do you want it pulled and voted on or do you just want discussion I just want a discussion okay so let's let's go back and uh, deal with uh, Councillor McKean's motion and then we'll come back to yours after that okay right. thank you well we might have to vote on mine depending on depends uh, on how you want to yes take that's right we yep, have an open start. mind here so okay so let's uh, let's call uh, the the roll on 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 the vote of uh, uh on this resolution that's proposed by Councillor McKean just to be clear Mr. Warden yes. we're, we're voting separately on 218 uh, yes. report 2818 so 218 18. 218. You're voting, you're voting on it separately whether to accept it as it is or not. <coughs> yes, okay. So, yes, Councillor Body. I'm just uh, wondering if uh, the clerks can use the whole screen because some of us old users back here um, can't read it. If there's a way to get it used a little bit bigger for <coughs> my glasses or there it is, by golly, look at that. <laughs> zoom, zoom. All right, we got it. So, see that now? I can't believe that lawyers have problems with fine print. <laughs> Don't knock it, he's being a gentleman. Thanks, uh, Arlene. Yes, uh, uh, <laughs> Councillor Pringle. Well, just, I just want some clarification, Mr. Warden, because the resolution is asking for it to be pulled and voted on separately yes so that's the first resolution that doesn't that's not okay that's not really what we talked about at first so that's just to, for it to be pulled and voted on separately okay yeah so we have to go back to the the other minutes all right, right. but then then we have Car uh, Councillor Ardell asking another another question so let's vote on this and uh, okay. uh, want to call the roll yeah recorded vote okay. Councillor Pringle no no No. Councillor Patterson. No. Councillor Hicks. Nay. Councillor Clumpus. No. Councillor Greenfield. No. Councillor Body. No. Councillor Wright. No. Councillor Bosbrook. Yes. Councillor Winter. Yes. 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 No. No. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Councillor Ardell, do you want to have a discussion on? on uh, CW 31-18. Yes, thank you. I guess I'll ask the Director of uh, Planning. Um, was there a joint meeting on September the 24th? Or was that just Meaford's? Through you, Mr. Warden, yes, that was a joint uh, public meeting. So uh, county staff were in attendance. There was a, um, a county representative, I guess, in terms of uh, as, as a joint chair, um, so uh, there will be minutes coming out from that public meeting. Um, yeah, so that was a joint public meeting. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, we had our council meeting that night too, so none of us from council could attend uh, uh, the Meaford council meeting and uh, this joint meeting. But we did have several ratepayers who were at that that have concerns about the roads and uh, who's going to be required to do the upgrades of the roads. Uh, we have a town line there that is maintained by Gray Highlands. Uh, when we um, rebuilt the bridge, which was a county bridge, and the, the banks of the road, um, it was supposed to be a three-way split many years ago, if I can remember, I was around, and uh, we just had the um, whoever who put the money in was the county and Blue Mountains. Gray Highlands never contributed to the upgrades uh, to that road. So I'm wondering if uh, 
great. Highlands is going to be contributing to any upgrades on this town line now, or if there's going to be upgrades to any of the roads, because this uh, is going to be a large winery. I'm not against economic development, but I am um, making sure that our roads are up to standards. That is a, a very narrow, a steep road and uh, it is a two-lane bridge, but uh, if tour buses are coming through that, they might have some difficulties. And uh, also coming up through the Clarksburg side road and the Thornberry side road, and uh, who is uh, going to be responsible for upgrading the roads, the Blue Mountains, or is uh, Meaford and Gray Highlands going to be contributing to this uh, development? I can see the look over in Gray Highlands that uh, they're just surprised. <laughs> well, that's a very interesting question. I don't have the answer, but uh, Randy will probably uh, say that we need some traffic studies and anybody's obligation would be based on uh, normal uh, obligations based on traffic studies. But anyhow, go ahead, uh, Randy. We have a public meeting, no doubt, but we're now in the process of um, finalizing a review and all those studies. Uh, we'll be taking in consideration all the comments received, including the comments we heard today. And uh, we'll be having some further discussions with both Blue Mountains, Grey Highlands, and Meaford to ensure that any traffic concerns have been addressed. Okay, does that satisfy your... Well, I believe our interim CAO will be meeting with uh, Rob Armstrong today. Today's th yes, Thursday. So maybe our concerns will um, come out today, but unfortunately we just didn't have any uh, staff to spare to go on uh, Monday night. or So it, it's sort of like, a, you know, we didn't get to comment, and so the yeah. Gray County uh, commented, and then Meaford commented, but the neighboring municipality didn't get their comments in on time. So, and I know they have to be in on a certain time frame, so, you know, I, I just have concerns sometimes that... Uh, puts the horse before the cart, and, or behind the cart, and uh, we're just not getting um, okay. our comments in. I, I appreciate that, but I would see that uh, our director of planning, who's uh, got tremendous integrity, would, <laughs> would make sure that everything comes together properly, so. Yeah. And, there, and there's still lots of opportunity for providing those comments and having those discussions. Um, so if there's any comments uh, from either Grey Highlands or Blue Mountains on this proposal, we're more than happy to, to receive those up to the point where we're recommending a, a final decision uh, or recommendation on this application. Um, so there's still lots of uh, opportunity to provide those comments. Um, I guess a deadline would be prior to approval of, of these applications. Um, so yeah, so uh, if there's uh, a need to have a meeting between Greyhounds, Meaford, uh, the county and the town, uh, we'll make sure and organize that uh, to make sure that any, like I said, traffic concerns have been addressed. Well, that's a good answer. Uh, yes, uh, good. Councilor McKean, you. Yeah, like thank you, and, and uh, thanks, Randy, for for <coughs> that. And I believe that that meeting should happen sooner than later because I think at the end of the day we all want to see economic development. But we would as a, it's a very kind of a unique situation where that uh, buildings to go is right on the corner of three municipalities, and so we're going to have a you know there be interest and Gray Highlands will have interest and, and Meaford obviously will, will have some interest as well as the county because that bridge is uh, owned by the county and so any roads going into it and the maintenance of it in future with the increase in traffic will be a county matter so I think that all four of us need to uh, be at the table. Okay well that's still the uh, notes are taken on that and uh, uh, I see Councillor Greenfield has a discussion point. Thank you Mr. Morton and uh, Thank you to our uh, reps from the uh, beautiful Blue Mountains for uh, putting us uh, on the floor this morning. Uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, as of uh, Tuesday this week, uh, the municipality of Meaford did apply a, uh, a surface treatment to the town line uh, that runs immediately in front of this, uh, uh, this particular property. Uh, so certainly that uh, particular stretch of the road is uh, uh, somewhat improved from what it was even on, uh, even on Monday. Uh, hopefully uh, Blue Mountains will follow suit on the Clarksburg and Thornberry side road with, with improvements uh, there. And I, I, I should add, um, 
that there will be traffic coming from the west to this establishment. It's not all going to come from the east, folks. Uh, uh, we certainly hope there is uh, an abundance of it, but uh, uh, that the Blue Mountains roads and uh, the shared Great Highlands roads will not be the only access uh, to this uh, to this facility. Uh, again, the uh, process is in motion. There are a lot of hoops and hurdles and steps to be taken, uh, and uh, we will be very, very cognizant, very observant of, uh, of the process as it goes forward. Thank you. Thank you, Harley. It's a tri county winery, I see. Yes. Yes, uh, John. Um. <coughs> Being I do so know a little bit about the subject, if this was to come to pass and has the amount of traffic that it has, uh, we really are appreciative in the town of Blue Mountains of uh, the town of Meaford surface treating the town line. Uh, but uh, if the traffic and volumes increase uh, to a certain point, you're actually supposed to hot mix the roads. Well, we'll sort that out at a, at a tri-municipal tri meeting. Yes, uh, Councillor Fosbrook, I'd like to move on, but... I'm sure you would. I'd love to as well. I'll be yeah, very brief. Okay, please. So in uh, adopting the minutes, on September 13th, we adopted the minutes from August 9th, and I would like to take this opportunity to formally reiterate that the decision that this council uh, made in relation to bylaw 5030-18, official plan amendment 142 regarding a gravel pit in the township of Southgate, I still believe we did not make a fully informed decision, and particularly that we did not listen to the residents. Thank you. Thanks for that comment. Uh, okay, so uh, Councillor Ardell, you, you, I think we've, we've uh, had a, a look at that. You're, you're um, not gonna... Yeah, no, I, I don't need a separate vote on that. I would okay. just like a discussion well, I sooner we than a... later with the uh, three municipalities and Gray County to discuss the roads, definitely. Thank, thank you. I'm certainly more enlightened now after you're pulling it. Thank you. Uh, okay, so let's go back to the, uh, uh, the original motion that was uh, moved by Councillor Hicks and seconded by Councillor Patterson that the minutes of the county council meeting and committee of the whole meeting dated September the 13th, 2018, and the resolutions contained there uh, be adopted as, printed, as presented. All in favor? Call the motion. All in favor? Opposed? Okay. That motion is carried. All right, moving along. Uh, that uh, that the uh, section B that county council closed meeting minutes stated September the thirteenth, two thousand eighteen, be adopted as provided. Put that on the floor. Councillor Pringle, Councillor Barfoot, and Councillor Pringle seconded that. You're being here and not objecting. Thank you very much, Councillor Pringle. Thank you. <laughs> That's covering up a mis Anyhow, any discussion on that? All in favor? Okay, thank you. That motion is carried. Uh, the next one is uh, that the uh, minutes of the Long-Term Care Committee of Management meeting dated September the 11th, 2018 be adopted as presented. Put that on the floor. Councillor Burley, seconded by Councillor Greenfield. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Motion is carried. Uh, section D, that the minutes of the CAO Performance Evaluation Committee meeting dated September the 17th, 2018, be adopted as presented. Put that on the floor. Councillor Eccles, Councillor Bell, any discussion? Put the motion up for a vote. All in favor? Motion is carried. Um, Why is it on the, the next one, that the CAO Performance Evaluation Committee closed minute meetings dated September the 17th, 2018, be adopted as provided. Put that on the floor for a vote. Councillor Eccles, Councillor McKean, any discussion? Call the vote. All in favor? Motion is carried. Okay. Uh, there's no closed minute meeting matters. So we'll move on to uh, bylaws. There are none. The only thing we have today is good news and celebrations. Anybody want to start that off? Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Warden Halliday. I, I'm uh, pleased to share that Gateway Casinos in Hanover is investing $18 million in our facility. 
Oh. Which will include additional gaming stations along with two restaurants and 70 additional jobs. So we're pretty excited in Hanover. But well, we are too. That's great. Congratulations. Uh, anybody have good news that will top that? Barbara Columbus. <laughs> Sure, I can top that, but uh, I just want to mention that uh, this coming weekend, of course, is our annual traditional Scarecrow Invasion Weekend, right. beginning with the uh, Family Festival and Parade at 6 o'clock on uh, Friday evening, followed uh, with the Apple Harvest Craft Show Saturday and Sunday. This is a huge tourist attraction for all of us around here, um, bringing in busloads of, uh, of people to the craft show. And uh, of course, the scarecrows have been up on the tours, have been there taking pictures as they always do. Uh, busloads have come in already. So very big weekend in the municipality of Meaford. So all invited, of course, happy to welcome you. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor Clumpus. That's always an exciting weekend, so yes. Thanks, Dr. Mr. Warden, and I'm, unfortunately, I can't uh, top uh, Mayor Patterson's uh, comments either, but I, I want to give just a brief summary from last weekend's uh, Concord Elegance that was at Cobble Beach. I know uh, two weeks ago we had the discussion, Councillor Boddy had brought it forward. I just wanted to give a, a brief summary of how the event went. Uh, we couldn't have asked for two nicer days, um, and attendance overall for the two days was over 10,000 people. Over 8,000 on the Sunday and, and approximately 2,000 on the Saturday for the uh, cars and coffee. The tour went through the city of Owen Sound out to Ingalls Falls, stopped at uh, Grey Roots. Resounding success at Grey Roots. Uh, they want to make sure that the tour uh, next year goes there again. Uh, then followed up and uh, had lunch at, uh, at our Wyarton Airport. Uh, was a, a great meal and uh, everyone was certainly pleased with that part of the tour and then went back to Cabo. So just wanted to say it was a great success <coughs> and from an economic development standpoint brought a pile of people to the area and uh, hopefully some of them will uh, uh, pack up. Uh, that's exciting. Thanks. Thanks. Alan. Yes, uh, Councillor Wright. Thank you very much. This weekend is the Salmon Run in Owen Sound. Uh, you can uh, start down at the bay and you follow it all the way down the rivers down to the mill dam where the the fish jump and it's quite exciting to see them try and get up that uh well they go up the fish ladder but it's quite exciting ending up at harrison park with a, a full day uh, conservation authority is involved in that day and they have uh, uh, different things fish tasting and uh, things for the children to do all involving fish and how to how the life story of them and it's a very educational thing so it doesn't cost any money and uh, it's open to everybody good time for all you can or i can yeah okay that's great uh, this is going to be an exciting weekend yes councillor Dell. uh one more point as uh, mayor clump has said it is apple harvest time and uh, as an apple grower we are seeing this is probably the best crop that uh, this region has seen in 35 years. So get out and support uh, apple growers, go to your farm markets, support all the uh, wonderful produce that's coming out as well as, as, well as the apples. And uh, I did bring some bags of apples for county council. Sorry, I didn't bring any for the audience out there, but uh, um, there are a couple of bags of honey crisp in there. Uh, they look good there this morning when I got my coffee. So uh, thanks for doing that. Um, Grey Roots also has uh, celebrating apple season uh, tomorrow night at, uh, uh, at 6 o'clock. So hopefully people will be able to come out to Grey Roots and help ce celebrate the apple season as well. So looking forward to seeing you there. Anything else? Councillor McQueen. Well, thank you, Mr. Warden. I'm just going to remind everybody as they start to see it today coming up here, the leaves are starting to turn. Right. And certainly uh, those that like to go for a drive certainly... Make sure you take in part of the Beaver Valley, which is uh, the heart of the Grey Highlands, and I think a big portion of uh, Grey County too. So you'll have some uh, beautiful views across that side, and maybe as your way, stop by and uh, spend some money in our area and enjoy the scenery. Thank you for that. Yes, Councillor Fosbrook. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, some of you may recall that Southgate recently um, implemented a seniors advisory committee. Right. Um, our Seniors Advisory Committee is doing a stellar job. Um, I know that the Deputy Mayor and I would agree wholeheartedly that 
they're definitely setting a standard in getting out there and, and speaking for the seniors, attracting seniors to the discussion, collaborating with other groups. They had um, a health fair two days ago, very well attended. And I just want to point out that, you know, those municipalities that don't have such a committee or an advisory board might want to take a look at what's going on. Uh, nobody will tell it to you like it is like a senior. And I think it's worth giving them some credit and some attention and perhaps consideration for doing more of the same wherever we can. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. It's certainly a model for other committees. So, all right. Uh, I don't see any other. Uh, yes. One thing I missed it. I wanted to uh, direct everybody in your new uh, book here that uh, on page 38, with regards to all the growth that's being positioned here for Grey Highlands, uh, there's a number of, of uh, developments that are just uh, on the uh, position to start to move into Grey Highlands, along with we have hired a full-time planner, sorry Gail, uh, Michael Brenner, and also a full-time economic development person, Michael Harris, sorry, Michelle Harris. And so it just shows you all the great things that are happening in Gray County, also along with uh, Gray Highlands in the sense of uh, us being progressive and moving a lot of things forward. And I know that was sort of pivotal around the whole school issue. And uh, and anyway, it's uh, great to see that uh, it's on page uh, 38, so take a look. Well, thank you for that. A lot of great things happening in Gray, including today's opening. So. Uh, don't see anything else uh, we can uh, call for adjournment. No. Motion to adjourn, Councillor Burley, Councillor Pringle. I cut you out of the eye there, Bob. <laughs> We're adjourned from the, this uh, particular council meeting. Uh, thank you. And uh, we'll just uh, reflect for a few moments while I get my other notes out, and we'll move into Committee of the Whole. And you got to see the fishbowl out there, too. That's all. The warden's memorabilia department. Okay, call this meeting to order. Uh, anybody, uh, committee of the whole meeting, September the 27th, 2018. Call this meeting to order. And uh, anybody has a pecuniary interest, please uh, state it when, when necessary. Uh, first thing is uh, the business arising from the minutes, and the first is the appointment of the Director of Legal Services. And we'll put this on the floor, and then the CEO will introduce you to our, our new uh, Solicitor of Record. That Gray County Council acknowledges uh, that Michael Letourneau be appointed the position of Director of uh, Legal Services effective October the 22nd, as approved by the Chief Administrator as administrative officer and in accordance with sections one and two of bylaw 5029-18 being the lame duck bylaw. Put that on the floor, Councillor Burley, Councillor Barfoot. Any discussion? CEO, are you gonna? Well, this is a very exciting one? day for Gray County. It's our uh, new um, Director of Legal Services has joined us this morning. I can confirm with Council um, after we met on September the 13th, um, we did um, complete our negotiations and Michael's here this morning and with your support, um, we look forward to having him start uh, later on in the month of October. So, uh, so we'll call the vote on that so that Michael can stand up and be <laughs> official. All right. All, all in favor of Michael's appointment? Thank you. Carried unanimously, Michael. So please stand up and say, he say hello. Thank you all very much, uh, Warden, Councillors, for uh, this opportunity. The lawyers are notoriously long-winded, and so I will keep it very short just to say I'm looking <laughs> enormously <laughs> to working with you all and with Kim and with staff in the years to come. Thank you. Well, congratulations, uh, and uh, thank you very much for... Uh, uh, joining us. We certainly need that as as we were struggling for some legal opinions this morning. So thank you very much and we'll welcome you on October the 22nd. Hopefully you and your family will have a nice move up to uh, to our area and that you'll be able to settle in. So thank you very much. Okay, moving on. Uh, we're uh, 
a little bit late, but uh, still not too far off. So at 10 a.m., we have uh, Nora Holder, President and CEO of the Collingwood General and Marine Hospital, and uh, Jory Pritchard Kerr, Executive Director, Collingwood uh, General and Marine Hospital Foundation. Ladies, will you please come up and welcome to uh, Gray County. So thank you, Warden Halliday, and thank you, councillors. Um, my name is Nora Holder. I'm the CGMH President and CEO, and it is a pleasure to be here today. I'm accompanied this morning by Jory Pritchard Kerr, the Executive Director of our Foundation. And we're very grateful that you've allocated this time to us on your very busy schedules. We're here this morning because the General and Marine Hospital serves a growing part of your county's population, including the town of Blue Mountains, and the municipality of Gray Highlands. Your county's largest employer, Blue Mountains Resort, is serviced by our hospital. As the major trauma center for South Georgian Bay, your weekender population and day trippers benefit from the exceptional skill and knowledge of our emergency department, physicians and staff, and often rely on the GNM as a center of excellence for orthopedic surgery. In fact, we are a very important part of the Gray County healthcare system. We are here this morning to provide you with a brief update on our new strategic plan, our plans for redeveloping our small and very aging facility, and yes, to request your financial support. We hope that you have all received the background documents that we sent to you with that have more detail related to this presentation. And we've promised to stick to our 10 minute time allocation, so please feel free to to refer to the document that we pr provided to you be, uh, as we speak. So with that, I'll get started. Oh, goodness. Down, right? Perfect. Thank you. I assure you we are not sitting idly by waiting for our redevelopment to occur. Everything that we do is focused on meeting the evolving and growing needs of our patients, despite the fact that we will continue to operate in a very small aging facility for the next eight to 10 years. We are continuing to innovate continuously to improve the patient experience in the environment in which our people work. We're building partnerships in the South Georgian Bay and across the province through the work of our physicians and our staff. These are our four strategic pillars that we uh, worked with in collaboration with our community, our municipalities, the county, uh, internal and external stakeholders, patients and families, and we're very proud of our new strategic plan and strategic pillars. An important part of our strategic plan is to ensure that we move our redevelopment project forward. I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you about our plans for redevelopment and update you in regards to our progress. Our facility was originally built in the 1880s. Additions in the 1950s were modeled on that era of care. At that time, there was no need to worry about infection control. Privacy wasn't really a concern, and today's technology could never even been imagined or fathomed. Our redevelopment plans call for a bigger facility to support our growing and our aging patient population with a total of 120 beds. We currently have 70 beds. Rooms and public spaces will be designed with our seniors population in mind and we will build space for more advanced technology such as an MRI. Importantly, we will provide more care closer to home. Satellite chemotherapy, inpatient rehab and a pain management clinic just to name a few. Your backgrounder provides much more detail on the advantages of our redevelopment plan. So it's a great plan, but how do we make this happen? So let me tell you. We've been working diligently with the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. Since the provincial election, we've had multiple meetings and are now on track to submit an updated stage one proposal with the most recent population projections to the ministry in early 2019. 
There seems to be general agreement that the Poplar Side Road site will provide the very best access for all our patients, including those from Gray County. This graphic shows the five stages of redevelopment and the government approval that is required for each stage. And as you can see, we currently are between stage one and stage two. But I want you to be assured that we do believe we will have permission to move to stage two in 2019. Our MPP, Jim Wilson, is working with us and is a great advocate. And now, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Jory Pritchard-Kerr, the Executive Director of our Hospital Foundation. Thank you, Nora. Welcome. Good morning, Warden and Councillors, and again, thank you for your time this morning. Um, after a lengthy and detailed work with professional planners, we believe that the uh, total cost of the project will be approximately $75 million. The Ministry of Health has a formula that calculates what portion of the project has to be funded locally, and we call that the local share. You can see that in yellow on the slide. We will need to raise approximately $75 million to cover the 10% cost of construction and design, as well as most of the cost of equipment and furnishings, along with the site acquisition prep uh, preparation and possible uh, demolition and remediation of the current site. This seems like a uh, gigantic number, but we do have it a plan to break that down into manageable pieces. When you look at this chart, you can see the number and the size of gifts that we reasonably need to solicit in order to make our $75 million goal within a reasonable time frame. I'm pleased to say that we already have a pledge of $20 million from Simcoe County, which will be payable over a 15-year period. We have $3.6 million allocated from Clearview Township, and we have the promise of many more uh, million dollar plus gifts from local residents, companies, and municipalities. To date, we've raised approximately $30 million in pledge commitments, and we are working with donors on another 15 million, um, which will probably come to fruition as soon as we have the stage one approval. The project is really too important to fail. So we've got a very good start on it. This uh, slide actually shows you the breakdown of our patient population by residence codes as indicated on their health cards. Um, you can see the percentage of the patient population that resides in Gray County. There is a very active family practice group in Clarksburg that has privileges at CGMH, and they account for a lot of the um, outpatient services that you see there as well as inpatients. The other thing that we have um, in extraordinary service is our obstetrical service, and with three wonderful female OBGYNs, we tend to attract very many um, expectant mothers from across Simcoe and Gray County. And so that's a large portion of our practice as well. You can also see the percentage of emergency patients that come from outside of both Gray and Simcoe County. We know anecdotally that many of these are weekend residents or day trippers. Um, and they are the people uh, quite often who are vacationing in the area, passing through, or have weekend homes. A lot of those um, emergency patients come in um, having sustained major trauma sometimes on ski hills. And so we know that a number of our ski resorts, which are extremely supportive of our hospital, are located in Gray County. So don't everybody guess, but that's what we're, what we're talking about. Our request today is based on the pa patient population that resides in Gray County, as well as consideration about the weekenders and day trippers that also um, are, are active in Gray County. As you're aware, Simcoe County pledged $20 million over 15 years, and we looked at that when we considered our request to you today. Um, we're basing this on an average of about 15% of our pa patient population, both those full-time residents of Gray County that reside here and those peop people who have our weekenders or day trippers and um, participate in recreation in this area. We respectfully ask you to consider the possibility of a $3 million pledge over 10 to 15 years. One important note is that the money will not be due to be start paying to the hospital until such time as construction is underway. 
And in other municipalities, they have started putting money aside over that period, knowing that it can be kept in their coffers to be paid at a later date. We thank you in advance for consideration of this, um, you know, very substantial request. Um, and I know that we haven't been able to paint a really good picture of what the future will look like. And so I'm going to show you a short video, if I can make this work, Jacqueline. Um, and I'd like to thank Jacqueline Morrison for all of her help today. I am going to exit this. Minimize it. And I'd like you to imagine what would be possible with your support. Is there sound, Jacqueline? Yes, okay. Now we're providing high quality care in an efficient, uh, compact space. So you just imagine what we would be able to do uh, if we we're able to provide that same high quality care in a space where patients can uh, really optimize uh, their enjoyment, which adds to overall uh, healing and well being. The biggest challenge that the infection control department has right now is finding beds for patients who come in with respiratory uh, conditions or infectious conditions. Imagine a hospital designed to today's healthcare standards with 100% private patient rooms to help control the spread of infection. Consider the impact on your loved one, the covering in a bright and peaceful space with accessible private washrooms and ample space to allow family and friends to participate in their care. The biggest challenge working in the Collingwood Dialysis Unit right now is space. We started in 1996 with two patients, so a total of 12 in a week, and now we're up to 44 patients in a week. Imagine a hospital that has sufficient space to provide more important patient services in our own community. An inpatient rehabilitation unit, a special care dementia unit, expanded dialysis services, pain management and pacemaker clinics, a satellite chemotherapy center, and an MRI unit. For patients who are currently waiting for access to these services or traveling over an hour away, this could be life-changing. The problem is the department is old. It's spread out. It was never <coughs> intended to have a modern CAT scanner in one part, a modern mammography machine in another part, and because of the geographic uh, spread of the equipment, it makes it very difficult for staff and patients because they have to navigate their way around. Imagine a facility designed to ensure overall efficiency, a building where departments are located together in ways that make sense for visitors and patient care. Consider a building that is designed so departments can grow as new services become available in the future and that physicians and staff can respond quickly and effectively to any patient emergency. We're working with nurses and other healthcare providers uh, such as radiology technicians and respiratory therapists and dietitians and uh, we know that those, all, those individuals need to be trained and we know that when we work together we are really maximizing the care for our patients. So what we really want to create is an environment where we're learning together. Imagine a building that's built for much more than healing that is designed to educate patients about their health, as well as providing innovative approaches and partnerships to train our next generation of healthcare professionals. Consider the impact an innovative teaching program could have on recruiting the best and brightest practitioners to our area. Yes, our hallways are small and narrow, and our facility is old. <coughs> Our physicians and staff have won national recognition for the work that they've done in this aging facility. Just imagine what we could do in a new facility. Imagine a health campus comprised of multiple health-related partners, connected by walking trails through an abundance of green space. Picture a hospital designed to complement the region's wellness approach. A facility that is not just environmentally friendly, senior friendly and accessible, but which focuses on the health and wellness of everyone who enters its doors. Through the air you breathe, the lighting used, the food you receive, 
every aspect of the building's design focused on the well-being of patients, visitors, volunteers, and staff. A building that is conducive to the overall healing process. Now that the vision has started to take shape, we ask you to imagine the possible. Imagine what your future hospital could be to you and your family as it serves the region of South Georgian Bay in the decades to come. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. We'd be happy to answer questions, and I will just hopefully close out. Are there any questions at this time? Yes, Councilor McKean. Uh, thank you, Warden Halliday, and, and thanks, Nora and, and Jory, for the presentation. I'm just wondering, in your numbers um, uh, on the on the ask, with did you factor? I know uh, you talked about the planning and getting updated planning numbers. Are those numbers um, that are infused in the emergency visits? Are they an indicated of or an indication of what we may see for increased tourism in the next ten or fifteen years? Has there been anything put in there? I know that we do do a lot of uh, work with the you know patching up the people that come up for recreation at uh, mishaps, but I'm just wondering if uh, we've looked into the future to see what that number could be because. You know, we t you hear numbers from Blue Mountain Resorts and uh, about, you know, there's a possibility for an additional million residents, in the, or sorry, another million tourists in the next uh, 10 or 15 years. Is there any numbers in there for that? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I'd like to indicate that those numbers were actually drawn from our actual 2016-17 patient population, so they do not project any future growth. We wanted to come to you with something that you could understand today. And uh, we wanted to be very fair about, you know, the allocation and, and the ask. And so those are hard numbers uh, from last year. Traditionally, we would see that about 20% of our patient population in the emergency department would come from outside our service area. Okay, thank you. That covers that off, John. Councillor McQueen. Warden, and thank you very much again for your presentation today and, and making Gray County aware of what's happening down in the South Georgian Bay region, as I guess we sort of look at that to a certain degree, right? I know that uh, both myself and <clears throat> Councillor Dell were sat on the Conant Hospital Board for a lot of years, and I know I was there for the redevelopment back in 1997, where that was all done, and certainly it's outgrown even that redevelopment. And it's certainly seeing that, uh, I think, as Mayor McKean is saying that about how that area growth is continuing to, to expand. And I guess that's the thing is, you know, do you have your finger on the right expansion numbers? Because it just, uh, as we see development continuing, especially in the Blue Mountains, <clears throat> keep ramping that, uh, those numbers up. I guess the other thing is, is uh, certainly from, from a regional perspective, I know that we've had a few meetings, um, uh, myself and the mayor and <clears throat> of Blue Mountains and other regional mayors, about that area and I, and I mentioned the South Georgian Bay region and, and not just to say the Collingwood Hospital but the South Georgian Bay Regional Health Center is sort of something that I, I think some of us have agreed that that, that whole thing is expanding out because they can't go to the north, we know that, right? So the whole growth even up toward Meaford and, and out toward the, the south and southern part of Gray, Gray County too. So I guess that's the thing is in that area of your hospital, is it going to be more moving forward into more a regional hospital that will be doing a certain type of procedure that smaller hospitals will not be doing so it will be drawing more from farther or far, uh, further from that region like more into Gray County in the sense of what they will be offering so that is not the intent the intent is to service the population that we currently serve it's not the intent to take away from any other areas of growth and in fact I would <coughs> like to say as Jory and I drove here we talked about Meaford actually being the next step in terms of individuals moving even further from Collingwood to Thornberry to Meaford so um, that is not our intent our intent is really focused upon <coughs> our growing region and in fact we are going to be updating our stage one uh, 1A and B with actually our 1A and B was we utilized actually uh, 12 13 data and that was two and a half years ago uh, no actually three years ago when we um, did we submit it the first submission 2016. 2016 so uh, now we are um, black lining which is actually just updating the data 
for uh, the capital branch and we will be using actually 2016-17 data. But the intent is uh, to not take away from other areas but to work in collaboration with, with other uh, areas as well. And what we, um, as you all know right now, uh, with LINs, they have sub-regions. And so we are actually the South Georgian Bay region. So we hope to service our patient population. LINs, unfortunately, or fortunately, are supposed to be administrative barriers. So therefore, we have, of course, we do serve Gray County. And that is why we're here, because people don't see administrative barriers. They go to where they want to go to quite quickly. So we're happy to service the population that we do and we will work in collaboration absolutely and also uh, when we have we uh, engaged with our uh, consultation we consulted with actually uh, Gray Bruce Health Services and other services as well so and we will continue to do so as well as with those municipalities such as yourself um, and where is the mayor of the town of Blue Mountains hello hello <laughs> I, I certainly appreciate the word collaboration because that's what we all have to do with uh, healthcare and everything else is work together and, and compete and not compete but to work together I see the individual from Blue Mountains Resort back in the audience here and I know with regards to um, the expansion of the hills like I don't know if it's a hundred thousand people on that hill at a certain time there's a certain time where when it's busy that really puts a lot of pressure on your emergency uh, um, facilities there and and certainly weather is a big a big factor on that hospital how it fluctuates and, and and that type of thing and I know that that that's sort of something from the Blue Mountains resort side I know is very uh, important to them for for the, uh, the I guess the, uh, the the clients that they have come to their resort I see dr. Lisi was on uh, on your screen there who uh, was a Great Highlands residence he actually took the appendix out of my son Steve McQueen so he actually uh, knows him quite personally so anyway thank you Thank you. I'd just like to add to that, um, you know, when we're looking at um, expanded services, it's mainly around our innovation that is being driven by our existing physicians and staff. And, um, you know, Nora noted in the presentation that we're not going to just sit idly by over the next eight to ten years and, and hope for a renovation. We are continuing to innovate so that we can service that population that will continue to grow and we're doing that through a wide variety of means, but mainly through the enthusiasm and the expertise of our medical staff and our staff. Well, thank you very much, ladies, and uh, it's been a very fulsome uh, thing. We have a big, uh, we have a big uh, <laughs> agenda this morning. If, if you can take two, a snapshot question and a snapshot answer, I'd, I'd appreciate that, so yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, my question to Nora and Jory now is, how do we move this forward? And I guess that to Ressa Gray County, how do we move this forward? Uh, you know, as Mr. McQueen stated, uh, you know, we both sat on here back many, many years ago on, on the hospital board. I think we did nine years, or maybe Paul did longer than I did. But we talked about redevelopment then, and, uh, you know, we're coming towards the stage two. This is vitally important to you know our community because of the amount of people that are coming here uh, you know many years ago we only had a million now we're up to 2.5 million and so we're just increasing constantly and that's exactly where you know a lot of the residents from our town go so I guess I'm looking for direction from here as to where we can go from you know if we can contribute this kind of money because I know when um, Nora and, and Jory came to Blue Mountains I said to them they need to make a presentation to Great County because you know a lot of the people in our municipality do use the Collingwood General Hospital and I hope that the hospital would be called the South Georgian Bay Regional Hospital um, and take the Collingwood out of it because uh, we are a region and uh, we have to work collaboratively together and uh, and that's, this is what we, we need because we have so many people moving to our area now. So I guess I'm looking to the warden as how, how we can drive this forward. Well, obviously today is not the day to do that, but it certainly requires deliberations over and above. This is for presentation and it's very fulsome, very, very well done. And uh, we appreciate, you know, the presentation. So um, at budget deliberations, which will come later on, I'm sure that uh, we will certainly consider a, a strategy moving forward on that. Good. Right. Thank you, Mr. Ward. And uh, Councillor Fosbrook, did you have anything to add? 
Well, um, I was going to ask a question, but you know what? I can ask that offline. The um, handout that we were given this morning yeah. is not the same as the presentation on screen. Will both of those be updated to our agenda? The handout that you were given this morning is the, is the background data um, that we didn't feel we could fit into the 10 minutes, um, but I'm, we can certainly I think make the rest uh, of the presentation available. I think what we've got is, is quite, quite full. It'll, it'll be updated, I'm told. Bo okay. both, both pieces will be added to the agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Eccles. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Quick question. How much for inflation have we put into this program? We have a hospital that uh, has been on the go in Gray County in Markdale for 15 years now, and the cost continuously rises exponentially. This one, we're just looking for private donations to meet what the whole build of Markdale is. So how much of inflation is in this? We, uh, there's about a 20% contingency in that budget. Um, however, we have to abide by what the ministry allows us to put forward as the cost based on our patient population projections. And um, so it's, it's really up to the ministry what the final budget is. You may have noticed in that presentation that um, about well over half of that is related to equipment and furnishings. Right. Um, and that's where kind of we have that, that factor where we can, we can change that budget a little bit. But by updating our numbers to the, uh, the 2016 numbers, that will again um, have the ministry take a look at that and, and um, look at those figures based on the updated um, population projections. Um, so it's not totally up to us what we put in as the budget. We have to follow the, the ministry requirements for that. But we do have some, um, some room in there um, to change, and we are constantly buying new equipment for the facility. Some of that equipment may move over, uh, so we may not need the entire equipment budget. Thanks for that feedback. Okay. Uh, I think we've had a good... Yes, Ke Ke Kevin, you, uh, <laughs> there's the man that's got to solve that puzzle eventually, so. Just a, just a question yeah. about, you made a comment about some of your uh, funding providers are, uh, are starting to plan to fund this and, and the, that funding would be uh, planned to come once the, the build was to occur. When, when do you anticipate a build year? I'm just trying to figure out how many years are, are some planning to spread out their savings to help assist you, that's all. So redevelopment is not a sprint, it's a marathon. Uh, we've been in this journey now officially for approximately three and a half years. We anticipate eight to ten years out to uh, actually putting a shovel hopefully in the ground. Uh, we stated actually five to ten years, three years ago. So we are being conservative, but um, also knowing that um, we have an MPP whose party is now in power and who is very influential, I'm pretty confident it'll be eight to ten years unless something happens in the next four years. Thank and I, you. And I might just note too that not the entire amount that you decide to give is due the day the shovel goes in the ground. We understand that you have planning um, projections and if you decide that you want to put that money aside over a 15 year period, we can certainly work that into our financing options. Um, there will be a lot of people because these are big asks that will be saying it's going to take me 15 years to put that together and we can absolutely work with that. Okay, thanks for that magic. Did Councillor Barford, were well, you? I, Mr. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Warden. I was just going to uh, actually um, bring forward a lot of what you had said. Uh, I think this is a great detailed uh, presentation to know um, how much actual usage is at the facility from, from Gray County residents, so that's much appreciated. And through our process, we'll have budget deliberations, and you know that's the time it'll brought, be brought forward. And I, I'm under the understanding that this council will have some some preliminary talks uh, on that, so I look forward to that discussion then. Yep, we're still on the job uh, yep. until the end of November, that's for sure. So anyhow, thank you ladies very much for coming. It was a good fulsome uh, discussion and uh, uh, good, good luck on your other presentations and we'll certainly take it under consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, it was our pleasure. And thank you. All right, uh, we're, <coughs> we had a, that was a, a lengthy pro program, but it's certainly worthwhile. So the next person up for a presentation 
is Connie McKay, Program Services Coordinator, Leanne Frisch, Board Chair, Paul Fraser, Treasurer, and Shannon Osborne, Director of Safe and Sound. Welcome, everybody, to Gray County Council, Committee of the Whole. Who's going to start? Don't Good be morning, shy. Good morning, and uh, thank you uh, for inviting us to uh, Gray County Council today. Uh, we also thank the staff of uh, Gray County for the opportunity to come and talk to you. I know that our time is limited, so I'm going just to make an introduction to myself as Leon Frisch, the chair of Safe and Sound Residents. Um, I have Paul Ferris, who is our treasurer, Connie McKay, who is our uh, program service coordinator, and Shannon Osborne, who is a director of Safe and Sound. Uh, Shannon will start to take us through the uh, PowerPoint, uh, and um, I will leave it with that. Shannon? Make sure everybody uses the microphone when you're making the presentation. Okay. Lift it up a little bit and lean in. There you are. Okay. Okay. We want to hear you. Thanks. Already sounds good. Good morning. Like Leon said, my name is Shannon Osborne. I've been a director at Safe and Sound for about a year and a half now. Um, so I'm just going to briefly go through our PowerPoint presentation with you today. So to start us off with some background, this space was opened in 2007 by a group of individuals that were concerned about local poverty. Um, and so we've been at our location for about 11 years and approximately 60% of our funding is community-based. We've listed just our vision, mission, and values here. Um, sorry, my voice is shaking. Um, and as you'll see, just kind of our basic thing is to provide a hand up and not a handout, and just really meeting our participants with where they're at. So the space is really kind of known as the go-to organization. Um, I've listed here a bunch of uh, different partnerships we have with local organizations. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, we see employees from CMHA Grey Bruce, formerly known as Hope Grey Bruce, um, public health withdrawal management. Um, we have Y housing workers using our boardroom to meet with clients. We have people calling for their clients on a daily basis. Um, churches are using our space. Basically, a bunch of um, different organizations are able to utilize our services and our location to meet with participants. So the space is just another name known um, that we're known as. So Safe and Sound just kind of um, developed this nickname um, because of the safe and inclusive environment it fosters. So we hold um, a variety of programs on a daily or weekly basis. Um, so just some of the ones uh, we have is a clean needle exchange where we're one of two sites in, in Owen Sound. Um, our transitional housing support program, which has four apartments. Um, our harm reduction program in partnership with public health, um, our weekly foot clinic, and then we also provide space for the quarterly immunization clinic. Um, one of the other programs we do offer is the after hours emergency shelter service, which Leon will talk about. The, the after hours emergency uh, housing sh uh, shelter program, uh, we've been involved with that since 2007. What we do is we have volunteers from Safe and Sound, I don't know that many people know that, uh, who have manned that phone for seven days a week, 365 days a year, at a savings of $45 an hour, uh, 45 hours per week, 2,340 2, hours per year, that we volunteer to Y Housing and the County of Gray. Uh, there's no money exchanged for that. Um, Safe and Sound um, answers about uh, 1,000 calls per night. Uh, we house about 365 people per year who are homeless. So uh, when we're talking about homelessness uh, in the after hours emergency, home line, uh, emergency phone line, we're talking about people who are invisible. We're not talking about the people who are pushing shopping carts down the street. We're talking about the people that you don't see. We're talking about people who, uh, 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 who are referred to us from 211. So an individual who doesn't have a place to stay, who's been couch surfing, who's been living with a friend or a relative, um, 
will call us through 211. We also get constant referrals from the police services, West Gray, Sogging Shores, Own Sound, the OPP. We get a, a, a number of referrals from Canadian Mental Health Association on a regular basis, community living. We get constant calls from the uh, ACT team at Detox. <coughs> we get calls from uh, people who are released from the Correctional Service Institution in Penetanguishene who end up uh, outside the courthouse having been released on bail with no ID, no money, no um, bank cards, nothing, in Walkerton, in Owen Sound. Uh, we have people um, who uh, end up in emergency treatment for mental or physical uh, uh, conditions who are not eligible to stay overnight and have no place to stay. They call us. We house them in conjunction with our partnership with Y Housing who pays the bill. We deal with people from every, every area of Gray and Bruce County, all the way from Tobermory to Kinross, down to Dundalk, over to Collingwood, um, into Meaford. Uh, there is no place in Gray County where we do not have homelessness. And I just want to provide you with uh, two weeks ago, um, we had a young woman come into our, our, our space um, and she was 16 years old. She was a high school student at Owen Sound. Um, she had had a confrontation, a disagreement with her parents the night before she came to see us. She'd gone downtown. She was evicted from her house. In my definition, that's homeless. This woman could have been 16. She's often between the age of 55 and 81 because of relatives who will no longer house individuals at a particular point in time. So here she comes to us. She's had a confrontation with her parents. She's 16 years old. She's going to high school in Owen Sound. She's a regular person. She ends up on a park bench in Owen Sound. Someone comes by later in the evening, offers her a drink, something to cool her off, keep her going. She doesn't know about the emergency helpline. She wakes up in the morning with no clothes on, and she ends up in the hospital for a rape test. Those people are homeless. Those are the ones that we're concerned about. Those are the ones that Gray County has a conscience about. So when we, when I ask myself the question, why do we have a homeless um, emergency phone line? It's to provide shelter for those people who are so marginalized, who find themselves in a position that they did not necessarily make a cognitive uh, um, uh, uh, decision to follow. They happen to be at the moment and they made a bad decision. However, if I have to ask myself this question, how much I am a taxpayer in the county of Gray? I live in the, in the great hamlet of Priceville. So if I have to ask myself how much money I want you as Gray County Council to spend to save my grandson, my grandchild, your neighbor, your neighbor's grandchild, your student in the county of Gray and Bruce, how much would you spend to save that person one moment of agony as a result of being homelessness? I think you'd agree absolutely with me. And for that, I absolutely thank you for your support in the past, and we appreciate your support in the future and we continue to look forward to our relationship with Gray County, the staff of the Directors for Social Housing and Housing and Ontario Works that have just made this all possible. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from, from our council members? Oh, you have some more. Okay, that's, that's okay. I thought that was a finale. It was great if it was a finale. Thanks, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So my name is Connie McKay and I am the Program Services Coordinator and I'm the person who's there on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we're represented today, uh, I am as well with uh, our board members. I think that um, if I were on your side of the table and I wanted to know more about what is this organization that we are funding and with the increased funding that we received in this current year has made a huge difference in what we do. You should know that uh, depending on, and I think you're all familiar with check day at the first of the month, um, on those days when folks arrive at Safe and Sound, we might see 25 to 30 people. By the end, or you know, mid-month, 
45 to 50 at the end of the month, we have 60 people, 65 people coming in to this small space at 310 8th Street. What they should expect from us when they walk through the door, they should expect to be treated with dignity and respect. They should have our support in terms of food, access to laundry facilities, access to a shower, because we're talking about people who are living on the street. They should have access to clean clothing, and they should have access to um, my work there is to provide peer counseling, which is to stabilize people, find out what their needs are, and refer them to those other community agencies that can continue um, helping that person move forward. We deal with a lot of folks who come in with mental health issues. We come in, we have folks who come in with addiction issues. We have folks who come in who are dealing with lack of housing and overall poverty issues. That's what we do and that's, in, that's important work. One of the things that we hear about and should hear about on a regular basis, just as you do, is working towards the prevention of homelessness. And I will be extremely on the, honest with you today and say that's not in our ballpark. We are dealing and will continue to deal with the folks who don't escape, who don't escape poverty, who don't escape homelessness, who are living with mental health issues and with addiction issues. Um, for the most part, I think we all end our days at the space feeling pretty uplifted by the work that we've done. But we don't forget that within the last 18 months, we have lost nine people ranging in age from 20 to 43 who used to walk through our doors, and they don't walk through our doors anymore, primarily because of addictions. And I'm talking about overdoses, and I'm talking about um, lengthy careers in alcoholism. But when we meet those folks who come through the door, we recognize that those are the attending issues, but the person who walks through the door is the most important person. And I'll only mention our transitional housing support program, which we run at 312 um, 8th Street East, which is above us. These are apartments that were left unattended for many years. And we were able, to, I actually found an old grant application to renovate those apartments to the tune of 200,000 plus. And that was you know, breaking it into many different apartments. And we decided that it made no sense that we're talking about homelessness and there are four apartments above us that are just falling apart. So with the participation of our participants, many who come with skills as electricians and plumbers, they have skills. They offered those and we did those renovations for $11,000 and opened those apartments within three months. And we house, we have four apartments and we house up to eight people. And it is a program I'm not at their landlord, they are not my tenant, but they are participants in a program that allows them to move forward. Everything is geared to their shelter allowance, and so when they come with us, it's 364 days, and in that time they work on goals and objectives and move on with their lives. But I will also be very honest and say it's not 100% success. With that, I will leave you, and I'm sure that you, Paul might want to speak to you. He is our um, treasurer about the financial picture for the space. And thank you so much for your time. Thanks for that presentation. Paul. The man. With the, the financial chart. But it's in their, it's in their packages, Paul. Yeah. Oh, it's in, in the package. Yeah. Oh, OK. Well, <laughs> well, good morning. I'm uh, Paul Fraser. I'm the treasurer for Safe and Sound. And um, have to start it up here, but um, I'm just going to take you through very quickly uh, um, how we do what we do. Uh, uh, my colleagues uh, spent a, a little bit of time giving you a brief uh, overview of the services and programs that we offer at Safe and Sound, and uh, I'm here today to tell you how we do it, um, how much it costs, and um, where the money comes from, and I'm going to do that very quickly. Um, in your package there, there's a chart that shows, uh, well, first of all, I guess the most important way in which we get things done at our place is volunteers. Simple as that. We have 45 volunteers. They do a ton of different things. Um, we, wouldn't be able, we wouldn't be there without them. Up until this year, we had one full-time employee, and that full-time employee was getting paid not much more than uh, uh, minimum wage. So um, we... We really do depend on our volunteers a lot. And uh, so we have two different, two major sources of funding. One is in that, in that chart, one's called funding, which is uh, money that we get from government agencies, grants, 
uh, ongoing uh, assistance. Um, and they, <coughs> the funding itself uh, goes up and down depending on what type of grants we get in, the, in a particular year. So we may have a specific grant for a large amount of money for one year and then it disappears the following year. But by and large, the biggest contributor, supporter of us in this group is Gray County. Um, they, anywhere from the last uh, three or four years, anywhere from 35, I can tell you what you gave us. <coughs> last four years, 29,000, 29,000, 39,000, and 99,000. So we count on Gray County to keep our place running. Um, and so we were very happy, pleased, and thankful that uh, you provided us with the large grant this year. And we're using that money to uh, move our organization forward. Um, I wouldn't say that in the past, that we've, we've operated on a shoestring, and that's great, but uh, at some point, you just can't do that anymore. We've got to move forward. And so we've taken that money that you've given us and we're actively spending it, frugally. Um, one of the things that we did, I think probably the most important uh, uh, item that we've done with that money so far is to hire a support worker for a transitional housing support program upstairs. Uh, that person is 12 hours a week and she is fully dedicated to supporting those people. Um, so uh, we have, we also upgraded the salary of um, our one full-time employee so that as we go forward and people start to retire, uh, we have the funds available that we're currently paying a, a, a market rate for those people. So uh, that's another use of those funds. Uh, and in addition to that, we're looking in the next two uh, quarters to hire a frontline worker to deal with the people that are in the safe uh, state. Um, the other source of our funding is donations. Yeah, donations and uh, we have some fundraising, small amount of fundraising, and we also have the revenue from the upstairs apartments. Um, and if you look at the chart, you can see that the last three years, we've had a nice consistent growth increase in our donations and, uh, and other revenues. Um, and that's across all of our groups, churches, local companies, uh, service groups, uh, individuals, you name it. Um, we're, we're, I think, very widely respected uh, uh, in Gray County by the population. And I think we're getting our name out there more and more um, so that, uh, you know, we can continue to do what we do. Uh, and with that, I'll just bring it back over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your time. We greatly appreciate it, and um, we won't uh, uh, need any further uh, of your time, but we appreciate um, all the support you've given us, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank any you very questions? much. Uh, certainly an enlightening uh, presentation. You're certainly filling a, a need that we know that exists, so we appreciate what you're doing, and we thank your volunteers. And uh, hopefully uh, the future will look bright for the organization because the need is there. Thank you very much for coming. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, well, thank you very much for coming. Have a great day. Take five, we'll be back for the next presentation. presentation. Thanks, Brian, and uh, welcome, Andrew. Nice to see you again. Welcome. Hello, Warden Halliday and members of council and staff and, and the public who are here today. Oh, I'm a little taller than the microphone. <laughs> um, in addition, thank you for the introduction, Brian. In addition to my day job, I also facilitate the South Georgian Bay Tourism Labor Supply Task Force, along with Brian uh, as a representative from Gray County. We have Simcoe County as part of this group, the municipalities of Meaford, Town of Blue Mountains, Collingwood, Wasaga Beach, uh, regional Tourism Number 7, as well as Georgian College and the Four Counties Labor Board, all working together in collaboration on the labor supply uh, challenges and particularly this project on attainable housing. Um, we commissioned a study, um, which is going to be presented today, and we retained NBLC consultants. They are one of the preeminent uh, houses that looks at attainable housing, um, bringing a lot of insights and uh, innovation from the sphere. Uh, they're well known for their work on the um, Regent Park redevelopment in the City of Toronto as an example. 
Uh, while our research focused on tourism, it really is applicable to most sectors, and you'll see that through the recommendations. Uh, the research we did, particularly with the uh, Four Counties Labour Board, indicated that labour shortages exist across manufacturing, uh, agriculture, tourism, uh, healthcare, etc. So we know this is a broader community need. Um, we we really hope that, and, and I, I want to thank the county for your support in collaborating on this initiative and we really hope that next steps will involve a bit more partnership between the the associated counties and the municipalities to chart the course forward uh, because it's something we really need to do in action um, at this time i will introduce you to josh mcleod of nblc who will walk you through the research findings and will all be available for questions afterwards so thank you very much over to you josh thank you welcome josh thank you thank you for having me um, so, as Brian and Andrew both said, um, we focused on South Georgian Bay um, and specifically on the tourism workforce, but we feel like these, this, uh, this work really has a lot of lessons that can be applied across the county and uh, to other groups beyond just the tourism workforce. So just to give you some background on our company, um, we're founded in 1976, so we've been in the business for just over 40 years. Um, mix of urban planners, um, market researchers, and uh, land economists. Um, we're very familiar with this part of the province. Uh, we've worked on both the public and private side. Um, from a public policy perspective, we worked on Great County Housing, Great County housing Study uh, about six or eight years ago, and the Town of Blue Mountains Housing Study. We've also done a, quite a lot of work over the last couple of years in Wasaga Beach. Um, on the private side, we've worked on a number of developments. Laura Bay and Cobble Beach are the two that we've got up here as examples. So why we're here, um, tourism sector is obviously a large part of uh, the South Georgian Bay region and the economy itself. Um, it's estimated that uh, within Simcoe Gray Bruce, there's about 1,400 tourism related businesses and 14,000 tourism employees. Um, currently the estimate is about a shortage of about 800 or so workers um, and attainable housing is um, the biggest factor in this shortage. Uh, this isn't uh, an issue that's solely going on in South Georgian Bay. It's estimated that the tourism workforce shortage across the province could reach um, 80,000 workers by 2025. Um, left to the market, we expect that the issue will continue to worsen um, and that labor shortage will continue to grow. Uh, there will be economic impacts. It undermines existing businesses if they don't have a labor pool to pull from. Uh, we know that a lot of businesses are already directing some of their capital towards housing their staff rather than um, to their actual business. Uh, it could have an impact on the regional tourism brand and you end up with uh, stalled growth and misinvestment opportunities. On the social side, um, it could lead people to be spending too much of their income on housing, not, not leaving enough money for other essential needs, uh, may force them to you know, commute longer distances or work longer hours, which adds stress at home. And it could also force uh, more young people out of the region, um, which leads to obviously an aging trend, which we're already seeing. Um, what is affordable housing or attainable housing? Uh, it's considered affordable for the household. So generally the definition is 30% of gross household income on housing costs. So that's your rent or your mortgage payments, um, utilities, property taxes, everything goes into that. Um, it also includes not just price, but a diverse mix of housing within the market so that households can move through the market as their needs change. Um, so this is a mix of pricing, a mix of sizing, a mix of built form or tenure. Um, yeah, and as I said, uh, it allows for, for movement through the market. So what's holding back attainability? You've got a lot of market demand that's pushing pricing upwards. Uh, you have a lot of affluent retirees moving to the community. Um, a lot of seasonal purchasers and short-term accommodations are also potentially playing a role in this. Um, essentially, pricing for housing is increasing at a much faster rate than incomes. Over the past six years, we've observed about a 58% increase in housing prices on average versus 14% for incomes. So it's very quickly outstripping it, um, which is a common problem across the province. Um, you know, the seasonal nature of these, these tourism jobs also play a role in uh, holding back attainability. There's a limited amount of entry-level housing across the region, so that's condo apartments or uh, rental apartments. Uh, rental units in particular are, um, are very limited. Uh, in the South Georgia Bay region, there's only about 1,000 purpose-built rental units. 
Transportation plays an issue in this as well. Um, most people are going to require a car if they're living up this way, um, and that's a fairly large expense to add on to someone, especially if they don't have a very high income. Um, and in general, there's a lack of incentives um, for the type of development that's needed to address this issue. So we did a quick uh, look at what is attainable based on um, a number of different income levels. Um, in this table here, uh, the red bands, they, they really don't have any options in the current market based on um, the current housing market. Um, essentially, anyone who's under $100,000 uh, really has very few options. So we came up with a few different uh, targets and priority groups. The first one, which is our really our highest priority, which is that red group in the previous table, is um, you know the minimum wage, the seasonal workers. Uh, maybe they're working part-time. They're, they're typically young, uh, single, and without children. Um, these are people who you want coming into your community to establish roots in the community, form households, and to reverse that aging demographic. Um, and we see an appropriate uh, housing type for them as being something that's similar to sort of dorm style housing that you'd see at other resort communities or even at universities. Uh, this could be in you know, a, a, a typical university dorm room where there's two people in a single room or it could be a larger apartment unit with uh, five bedrooms where everyone has their private space with a, uh, a shared common space. Our second uh, priority here is purpose-built rental housing. As I said, there's very little of this across the region. Um, this is something that really hits on incomes in the, or household incomes in the range of forty to seventy-five thousand um, dollars. And this is housing that people need when they first come to the region. Not everyone can afford to purchase a house right away. Not everyone has time to seek out a house to purchase right away. Um, so rental housing is really a place where people can. Um, when they're starting a new job, moving to the region, they can come and live there for a year or two and then potentially move into the ownership market if they're able to afford it. Um, rental housing also gives an opportunity to these people that are in the entry-level housing to move up through the market um, as their means change. Uh, the final one, which is also important but certainly not as high of a priority as the previous two, um, is affordable home, home ownership options. Um, so this would be for households that are under $100,000. And this could be a mix of housing types. It could be single detached, it could be townhouses, um, or it could be condo apartments. So our report itself, uh, hopefully everyone has a chance to read it at some point if you haven't already. Um, we go through a bunch of different options for providing attainable housing, but um, for the purpose of today, since we're a little short on time, I'm just gonna go through some of the recommendations. So the first thing is um, adjustments to land use policy. Uh, it's really the first step to be able to encourage this type of development. Um, really, you know, there's opportunities to build on what's existing at the county and local levels in terms of policies and programs. I know Gray County seems to be ahead of the curve in the region. Um, you know, today, obviously, you'll be discussing a community improvement plan and official plan review, um, and a lot of these things are already in there. But our thought is a community improvement plan goes a long way to, to helping this type of development, um, and then having uh, policies within your official plan that um, you know, take a housing first approach to surplus land or to Section 37, um, encouraging secondary, seat, secondary suites, um, potentially exploring inclusionary zoning. Uh, this would have to be done with care, obviously. You don't want to um, ruin the feasibility of a development by having inclusionary zoning put in. Um, you know, and ensuring that land or incentives are provided to housing, whatever groups are decided are the priority for the region. Um, there's also the potential option of an enhanced second mortgage program. I know Gray County provides down payment assistance as it is, um, but there might be an opportunity to en enhance that, which I'll get into uh, a few slides from now. So the first sort of idea um, in terms of projects would be a public-private partnership. Uh, these are widely used across the province. Essentially, the public sector provides land and incentives. The private sector in exchange provides uh, equity and their experience and uh, an afford a, a level of affordability. So how that might work from a project perspective, um, the municipality or the county could put out an RFP um, that targets that entry level workforce in this example. Um, so we're thinking apartment style dormitory housing. You've got a uh, 
floor plan here that shows a five bedroom unit and how that might work. Each of those units has its own, own bathroom. Um, so that would be the first step, start with the RFP on the public sector side. Um, we're thinking that with a project like this, um, an incentive that the public sector wouldn't even have to offer would be um, to gather an employer group together to basically underwrite the project um, to provide a rental guarantee to the developer. Um, this could be, you know, organized by Blue Mountain Village Association as an example if it's done in the Blue Mountain Village area um, and really provides an incentive to the developer to come into the community and, and build some new product. The public sector would then offer any incentives as they're needed via their CIP uh, and the developer would build the project to the specs of um, the public sector and the employers based on level of affordability, design, public realm, unit type, that type of thing. The second idea is sort of an enhancement of the existing uh, down payment assistance via a second mortgage program. Um, in this sense, the idea is to bundle incentives and apply, the, apply them as a second mortgage to the purchaser. So you're not just giving the incentive directly to the developer, it's also going directly to a purchaser. Um, essentially, if we're talking about, say, a development charge waiver and um, planning fee waivers, um, the developer gets the benefit of a waiver, um, which then lowers the price of the individu in individual units. Um, that second mortgage goes to the purchaser to help them with their down payment, which we find is um, really the toughest part for a lot of people to access the market. A lot of people can afford a mortgage payment. They can't necessarily get the large down payment together in order to purchase a home. Um, and the purchaser would enter into an agreement with the municipality or the county, whoever's running this program, um, to pay back that second mortgage at a later date once they sell their, their unit. Um, it's possible to take an approach where they would pay out a percentage of their equity on top of that, essentially as interest to the public sector. Um, and so this really acts as um, a deferral rather than a waiver, which is also beneficial to um, whoever's running the program. Um, our thought with this one, rather than just applying it as an overall program, would be to partner it with a specific development, um, reaching out to a developer partner, and saying, you know, either all of the units in the building or a portion of them uh, would be offered this second mortgage opportunity, um, provided that it goes to the target groups. Um, and this would help to not only improve the exposure of the program itself, but uh, should also help the sales and marketing aspect for the developer. Um, how that might work, uh, same as the other one, you start with a request for proposals to find a developer partner. Um, in that request for proposals, you'd be outlining who you're targeting. Our thought here is couples and singles and ownership units. Um, these ownership units, as I said, could be a mix of different built forms. There's a picture here of an Options for Homes project, which um, is a private sector developer that uses a similar model. Uh, these are stacked townhouses. So it doesn't necessarily have to be apartments, though it certainly works from that form. Uh, the public sector obviously offers the second mortgage to purchasers as well as any additional incentives that may be needed. Um, and once again, the developer builds and operates to um, the specs that were provided via that RFP. Uh, another idea that's come up, sort of a creative solution. Um, we heard about this a lot at the OPPI Symposium in Meaford in, uh, in April, is the idea of a tiny home project. Um, essentially, the public sector would need to go through the approvals process and potentially uh, make some changes to the building code in some cases um, in order to allow this. Um, but it could be a way to create some more affordable units, whether it's on the ownership or rental side. Uh, the developer would ensure design consistency and the, the operator, which could be public or private, would then establish uh, rates and lease terms um, based on whatever the affordability agreement is and they would manage it over the long term. Um, this is the type of thing that could work in an area that's a little more sensitive to height. Um, somewhere where you know a four-story apartment building may not be appropriate. Um, some principles that we've put together to keep in mind for any uh, attainable housing program. Um, the first one is to really communicate the return of investment and the cost of inaction. So that's uh, you know communicating to the public what the cost of inaction on this issue is um, and what the potential benefits of building this type of housing is. 
um, and communicating the investment opportunities to the private sector uh, to try to sort of pull some, in, pull some developer partners up to this region who may be interested in building this type of housing. Um, obviously, strategy should be uh, catered to each community. Um, Blue Mountain Village is going to have different priorities than Meaford, who's going to have different priorities than Thornbury. Um, so catering it to each community, um, you know, what their priorities are, what, the tar tar what their target groups are, um, and determining which strategies are best uh, for each of those communities. Creating a menu of incentive programs, which um, has already been started with, uh, you know, the initial CIP work. Uh, this could be performance-based, um, based on whether or not the developer is able to house the target groups, whether or not, depending on what their affordability level is, uh, the type of units they're offered. Um, there's a whole host of things that could go into that. Um, predictability and budget certainty are obviously important for the market. They want to know that there uh, will be money in the reserves for incentives on a year-to-year -year basis if they're going to come up here and invest. Um, and then market outreach, which sort of falls into that first point of commu communicating the return on investment. Um, but really, it's about uh, you know, market soundings with the private sector to um, find some partners on this. And finally, uh, just recommendations for the different partners that are involved. Um, as we talked about, uh, we think that there's a role here for the employers in the region to play, especially in an area like Blue Mountain Village where there's a large concentration of, uh, of tourism businesses. Um, we think that underwriting a housing investment would really go a long way to attracting some developer partners on this um, and really would essentially act as an incentive for the developer that doesn't cost the public sector anything. Um, it would also show leadership on uh, the employer side and, and create some support for these initiatives. Public sector, um, leverage existing programs like we talked about, um, you know, determining local needs and, and what the target workforce groups are in each of those localities. Um, determining which incentives or options are realistic by community or for the county itself. Um, you know, what can the county afford? What can the municipalities afford? Can land be offered? Is that an option? Um, and putting a CIP in place in order to be able to, af to offer those incentives to the private sector. As we mentioned, this is already happening in Gray County. Um, so we're sort of on the right track already. And then both partners, employers and public sector will need to sort of work together to outreach to the uh, development community and do those market soundings to let them know about the investment opportunity and um, sort of get moving on this uh, on this topic that's it for me okay that's a great presentation uh, very enlightening and uh, Andrew you're up here and hope hope ho yeah um, uh, it's important to point out that the the recommendations in this study really can be used and applied in many different uh, municipalities within the county and uh, we believe that it's a, it's a template that others can use, knowing that there will be different dynamics and employment dynamics within each and housing of values. But we really encourage others to take a look at it and, and use it if possible. We'll make sure that the final report is available for all via the, the postings here. Um, in terms of next steps, our partners have pulled together some funds and we have been doing uh, events like this, uh, presentations at the county level, at the municipality level, and we have allocated some funds to help uh, staff teams and planners and, and community groups sort of figure out how to action these uh, recommendations, which is critical. One of the funders of this research project was the Ontario government through the Tourism Development Fund. And as you can imagine, across the province, communities and, and particularly rural tourism communities like ours are experiencing these same issues and challenges. They've seen our work here as a template that can be used in other places. Uh, the village association tends to uh, lead on projects like this and then uh, we share externally. The Tourism Development Fund uh, through the province of Ontario has already indicated that there may be the possibility for us to come together uh, to fund further projects of consultation to help us uh, take these steps into action going forward. So I just wanted to put that out there. It's still to be defined, but it's a next step for us. Thank you. Thank you uh, for you and your association for being the spark plug to get us fired up. That's uh, most appreciated this. It's on everybody's lips, attainable housing. So any questions directly uh, of Andrew or Josh? Well, thank you. Uh, Oops, sorry. 
There you are. Sorry. <laughs> Need my sunglasses on there. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Thank you very much for the presentation. Sure. So clearly you know that we're reviewing our official plan. Mm -hmm. And with your expertise, have you actually commented on our official plan? Um, not specifically on your official plan, no. Anybody can. Pardon me? Anybody can. Yeah? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I can't say that I've reviewed it in detail, um, but I would say that some of the, the land use policy recommendations that we've provided in our report should probably be taken into account for that official plan, things like the housing first approach, um, things like in, encouraging secondary suites and basements, um, you know, and, and obviously getting the community improvement plan in place um, are really the, the steps that are sort of going to start to catalyze um, the work on this type of development. So if I may, I just wanted to, uh, and you know, I appreciate that not everybody's going to read the official plan cover to cover. Sure. Um, I attended the forum in the spring, and um, I really haven't heard anything to the contrary where the principles seem to be that there's just no money in this for the free market developer. So I don't know that you have an answer to that, but what I'm always wondering is every time we approve another subdivision, if the objective is to have 30% attainable or affordable housing, we're really not in control. Sure. So what I'm hearing you say is the only option is to incentivize and I think it's important for us to recognize what we're giving and what we're getting and how we secure the leverage to make sure we get what we expect. So right. again, I don't expect you have ready answers, but see, these are some of the questions on my mind. So we think that there is potentially an opportunity beyond just incentivization um, to do some of this work, uh, specifically this type of model here, something that's similar to sort of dorm style or, um, oh, I guess it's not up there anymore. <laughs> um, you know, the one that's got the, the five bedrooms per unit. It's sort of a student housing model almost. Um, we did a financial analysis and depending on the level of incentives, you could be looking at about 570 to $700 per bedroom per month um, for that type of unit. Uh, 700 would be no incentives, no public land. Um, part of the issue here is we think that a lot of developers that are in sort of the student housing development sector, um, they don't necessarily know about this market up here from this perspective, right? You don't have a, a large student base here, so they're not necessarily looking in your direction, but with some market outreach and market soundings, talking to those companies, we think that there's an opportunity to bring that model up here to use for the tourism workforce um, and have them make the money as, as they would in, in any other community that has a large student population, right? It's so they're, they're, they're basically, they're, they're making money in other communities at those rental rates, so there's no reason why they can't do it here. Part of it is reaching out to them and letting them know that there is a market for this here. Um, and there's a lot of people who are in need of this type of housing, right? They've got the model already, already in place. It's just a matter of convincing them that there's an opportunity here. And maybe that starts with incentives. Well, that's our job to, to yeah. pull it all together and... and, yeah. and maybe the first building or two. To start with incentives and then right. get some momentum going and um, start having more people... Councillor Ardell is very passionate about uh, Town of Blue Mountains and the needs there, so... I'll let her have a few words. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Warden, and thank you, Josh and Andrew, once again for coming and explaining this. It's a, it's a, it's a vital uh, form of living in our community and uh, having the Village Association come here and speak. Uh, we have Blue Mountain Attainable Housing Corp that I sit on and Andrew sits on and we just had our meeting yesterday. And, uh, you know, it's getting past some of this nimbyism and uh, people don't want a four or five story uh, uh, dorm like this and this is what is going to be happening. It has to happen to be able to bring the workforce up here. We need a workforce and it's crucial for 
the, for us to even move forward or to have a resort, uh, bringing uh, developers up here that can build something like this and giving incentives, it, it's just so vital. But this isn't just for the town of the Blue Mountains. This is the whole South Georgian Bay region, right across the bottom of the bay there, from Collingwood to Blue Mountains to Meaford, even to Owen Sound. And if Owen Sound has land and you could build, that would be wonderful too. And we get a transportation corridor, that's vital as well, this transportation corridor and bringing workers and, but also collaborating with Georgian College and other employers so that we can get, you know, this type of housing and start off in the Blue Mountains where it is, it's vital. Um, you know, I, I guess I have another question, which would be to Anna Marie Shaw, wondering if we could stack some of these incentives that we get from the province, or can we um, talk to the province about stacking incentives? And, uh, you know, each of our municipalities, along with Gray County, you know, having these incentives so we can move something forward and, and bring developers because the developers that are in the town of the Blue Mountains right now, they're just uh, there to build these million dollar homes and make the biggest buck and, and move on to the next one. You know, people aren't interested in this type of housing form. So, uh, you know, it's getting the developers from out of town coming up and doing something. So I was wondering, I can't see you. I should be standing, but my bad knee doesn't allow me to stand hey, too you long. Didn't sit. But yeah. there, um, so standing. just wondering. So, Marie, um, do you want to make a comment or? Sure, certainly. Yeah. Right. Um, we currently do have our um, home ownership plan, which is a 5% down payment. Um, I believe uh, the household income is up to $77,000 and the house price right now is $364,000. So I'm not sure if we're in line with um, many opportunities for the town of Blue Mountains at that price range. And again, it is sort of the spirit of that program is probably looking more at your your lower end of, of, um, of income or that lower level of income. Um, as for stacking, if we were to give a 5%, typically we have not in the past, just simply because we only have this much money and this much need. Um, we sell out uh, still, even without those house prices for Gray County. Uh, but certainly it's a great program. So if there is a way that we could look at um, improving or, or getting more funds into that and look at a stacking opportunity with another partner, I don't think it's a bad idea for certain. Right now it's just funding. I will also say too that we don't have any more funding in that program until we find out what's going on with the provincial government too. Right, but there's lots of things happening, so. And one more question, yeah. you know, you, you quote $350. We have the attainable housing and, and you can't even purchase a home uh, for under 400. So ours is 400 and you can't have income over 100,000 and we're still having a hard time. We have young people in our town who you can buy a tear down at 375. There was two on Bruce Street that just went for that. So it uh, it's very difficult, so even just condos, you know, are not even going for that. So Andrew may add to that. Well, I'm just going to add to, to Anna Marie to your question earlier. I mean, these are some examples of where the market is out of balance. Yep. The market in many of our communities is driven by external factors being retirees and weekend uh, home purchasers. Town of Blue Mountains, the average house price is is what Gail now? Seven hundred and sixty-eight. Uh, and our and our local economies uh, aren't uh, uh, are out of sync with that. Um, and we're not just talking tourism. We're talking healthcare. healthcare. We're talking manufacturing. Every sector is in the same boat. So we do need uh, an approach that has to to intervene in the market somewhat. What's beautiful about what the recommendations here is that they are sort of multi-stakeholder related. So you have employers at the table, you have municipalities coming together, counties, et cetera. And um, to your point about, about setting standards and putting a sandbox around, that's the beauty of the RFP process and the recommendations is that the community can decide what it values, who, where, what, how it looks, how it gets done, and then you can go to the market in a competitive fashion to get the right project for your community. So. The, this presentation is really about a model to getting it done and um, we're at a stage now where each municipality is sort of evaluating how it wants to do it. Uh, an ask I would put forward to those of you around uh, the circle here today at uh, County Council is we, we really would, it would be helpful to have your team uh, at team staff working a little more closely, not that they're not already, they've been doing a great job and we've been consulting all the time, but it would be great to see some sort of an initiative or a project where we can have our teams sync up a little more closely and chart the course forward together. 
Uh, each municipality can't do it alone. It has to happen in a partnership, and I believe now's the time to start doing that. Well, thanks for that very solid advice. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we've got to start to take charge at the county level yeah. and work with our partners. And Council, I have some more questions. I Council Wright, then Council McQueen. So, Wait, yes. I just, I just wanted to point out that further on in our agenda, when we talk about the community improvement plan, economic development has that at number one increase housing, attainable housing stock, including secondary suites, multi-unit housing, et cetera. There's the door for you. I mean, are we have a, an economic development council that you could work closely with, that they have the same uh, purpose and meaning as, as you folk have right yeah. there, so. Oh, and, and we have been working together and synchronizing for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. all along. Oh. But, uh, but that's, that's what has to happen. But we need to ramp up the urgency. I think that's already what. already agreed to it. <laughs> as spark plugs need, yeah. need some some energy. Yes, Councilor McQueen. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And, and I know in the spring there, and I thank uh, Barb Compass for holding that uh, event with regards to attainable housing. The question came up about tiny homes and about that size. And there was a, bill, uh, a CBO from the Blue Mountains said around 850 square feet. Well, we had, uh, Gail can attain this, we had a speaker at our AMOL board meeting and then it was, they had a booth at the AMOL conference. And I asked that question. They were, they were, for, were CBOs from the Association of Ontario for, for building officials and I asked that question to one of them and they said the minimum minimum is around 250. So I mean you have condos in Toronto that are 500,000 square feet so I think we really need to nail down what is the minimum minimum size for a tiny home because I think that's going to be your entry level opportunity right there and however it, whether it's like a condominium type thing where there's eight and a lot that are tiny homes that have separate units because I can see where you have a room and a common bathroom or whatever maybe works for some but doesn't work for families or young people or whatever because there's privacy issues on that kind of stuff. It, right. it really so, is a spectrum of options. It, it's a spectrum of, of options, built forms, and it, it really needs to be a spectrum of housing for people at all stages of their life. Entry level worker, young family, single person, growing family. I mean, what, what you see if you look at many of our communities is homogenous uh, construction of, of much larger um, single detached homes, it's out of step with um, the needs. So my, my takeaway here is we got to drill down what is the minimum minimum and if it needs to be changed we need to drive that change. I understand certain sizes, you even see IKEA advertising uh, a, a little tiny home on wheels and, and, they're ever, and they're decorating it, it's on TV. So I mean like that's just a little tiny house on wheels. So, I mean, let's get it, let's, let's drill it down. If it needs some pro, uh, pro, provincial changes, whatever, let's do that. You're talking about innovation, is what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, because right. it's, it's wow. happening in the States. That was one of the presenters was showing that this is happening down in the States. So, I mean, certainly we have winter and we have other aspects of our weather and stuff like that. But I think we really need to, as maybe us is around the table and, and the province, we all need to work together to drill that down, to move that bar forward, because at least that gives a start. And I, I don't know how young people today are ever going to afford, like you said, the average, you know, like, I don't know what the average price in the county is at 300, whatever it is. It's just like, and, and especially they raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks, but holy smokes. 14. Yes, uh, thank, thanks, Councillor McQueen. Uh, duly noted, and, and Randy, I know, is in charge of our, uh, our official plan, which I, he's addressed a lot of these issues. He's talked to a lot of people. And now he's bringing forward a community improvement plan as well. So I think the county sees the urgency uh, attached here. And once we get these plans approved, I think we got to uh, ramp it up even further. So. And, and we didn't plan this, uh, uh, to be honest, uh, in terms of <laughs> the having thing. the attainable housing study and Recolor Gray and our community improvement plan program present at the same council. We didn't, we didn't plan it, but uh, I, I Couldn't like Couldn't be better. Right. Um, with respect to the question on the tiny homes, so um, we have heard from the province on that. It is, for one or two people, uh, the minimum size through the Ontario Building Code is 188 square feet. Um, so we, we do have those numbers. 188 square feet, yeah. Right. So 17.5 square feet. Bigger meters. than a bed bedrock. Bed yeah, it works out to be. So it, it's it's small, right? But it's right. Uh, but that's the number in terms of the minimum size for one or two people. Okay. Uh, under the Ontario Building Code. Um, what uh, um, and, um, there was the question in terms of the town of the mountains. So they are in the process of uh, updating their zoning bylaw. Their updated zoning bylaw has removed that minimum size requirement. 
And that's what we're going to be recommending to municipalities is if you have still some of those legacy uh, minimum size requirements in your zoning bylaw, take it out. Let the building code ride. Um, we have that in our recolor gray in terms right. of providing again more flexibility in our zoning to allow for some of these projects to occur. If if we get to a stage where we have are working with developers and others to make these projects happen. Thanks very much for that, Randy. And uh, looks like we're we're ready to charge ahead. So thank you both for coming here this morning. It's great to have that inspiration uh, brought before us, and uh, I'm sure that uh, we're not going to let it slide. It's, it, the, it's too urgent, so thank you very much. Okay, uh, we're still on business on target here. Uh, we could bring up the uh, con consent items be received and that staff be authorized to take actions necessary to give effect and recommendations in the staff reports and that the correspondence be sur be supported or received for information as recommended in the consent agenda. Put that on the floor. Councillor McQueen, seconder, seconder Barbara Klumpus, uh, discussion. Anybody wants to pull anything or we move forward? Yes, Councillor Eccles. Thank you very much. I'd like to pull uh, D, is the uh, correspondence from Saugeen Valley Children's Safety Village. Okay. You'll, you'll pull that as a separate item? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. All right. Any other items to be pulled? Councillor Fosper. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, at the risk of pushing an already busy agenda, I would like the opportunity to comment on every item saving except item F. Well, do you have any questions rather than comments? Yes. Okay, so um, you're not pulling anything, not recommending? You. I don't foresee a need to make any motion. I just okay. would like the so opportunity how to... About, how about if we, uh, we approve what we see here? There's one item pulled, and then we can come back and, uh, and, and review it after it's, uh, after it's been passed. Okay. So you're going to allow me the opportunity yes. to discuss these items? Yes. In spite of the fact that we will have approved them and per the procedural bylaw, if I want to discuss them, I have to pull them. I just want to be clear. Uh, rule, uh, see how we can. If at the mm. end of the agenda, um, you wish to make some further comment in other business, I think we can do that. But for right now, we need to either pass these or pull them. Right. Okay, so I want to make sure that I have the opportunity to discuss these items. So I am pulling everything but F and D, because Councillor Eccles already took care of that. Okay. And uh, can't stop democracy here. Um, so, hmm? we will uh, move to uh, pass recommendation F, uh, addendum to uh, uh, EPCOR franchise agreement, Chatsworth and West Gray. That's the only one we're passing now. Um, all in favor of this motion, that, that motion is carried. Okay, so uh, later on we'll come back, we'll discuss uh, the items that have been pulled at the end of the agenda. So. Yes, yeah, so I think it's, um, I don't know, is I, there- I wonder where, is Rob here? Well, we're timing, timing is tough here. Uh, we have to, uh, we have the official opening at one o'clock. So um, I don't think the official plan should be started without- How, how much, Randy, what do you think? Guessing at least a half hour. Yeah. With with comments and so discussion. So if we, and it's reasonable to anticipate we have 45 minutes. I think. CIP program could be the same. Okay. So we, Riley, uh, if we put Mr. the point of order, Mr. Order, Mr. Warden, could I move a motion that we deal with A to F now and get that out of the way? Because we did do it last time. I thought did we not? Earlier on in the do agenda. Do that right now. Did we not? I thought we did. We'll I do it one time. We did. We will do it later. I've got you know, community improvement plans and, and uh, recolor gray to, to deal with, I think are very important. So we're gonna bring that forward then, ask for a two-thirds majority to move 
the uh, uh, color recolor gray uh, up forward. All in favor of uh, bringing it forward and discussing it now? That motion is carried. All right, Randy, let's let's roll on the community improvement plan. Or sorry, on the official plan. Uh, official plan. <laughs> recolor gray. You're going to miss 7A. Point of order, Mr. Mm -hmm. Warden, put it on the agenda. Pardon? Put, it, put, it, make, uh, put the motion forward. Uh, we'll oh. Move, we'll move the motion. Put it on the agenda. want to put a, a motion to the, Yeah. Okay, yes. We have to officialize it. I understand. We approved it, but we didn't officialize it. So there's a Barbara Compass moved by, seconded by. Who will second that motion? Councillor Greenfield, that the agenda be amended to uh, discuss recolor gray. All in favor of that motion? That motion is carried. Thank you very much for that, Barbara. Yes, Randy. Thank you very much, Mr. Warden and Committee of the Whole. County Planning staff are very excited to be able to bring forward a revised official plan, which we are recommending be adopted by Council in October. For the presentation today, we want to give you an update on where we're at, how we got to this point. We also wanted to highlight again why we plan, just to provide some context on why we even have an official plan. We also want to do a quick official plan recap, just to highlight some of the key principles that we heard from the community that led to the creation of this plan and also provide a quick overview of some of the key sections of the plan. We will then provide an overview of some of the recommended revisions, identify some further recommended revisions, which we'll get to in a little bit, and then talk about next steps. So where we are at and how we got here today. So the draft official plan was presented to Committee of the Whole back in November 2017. We posted that draft, we circulated it, we had lots of conversations, we had a public meeting in open houses in March of 2018. Uh, we posted all the comments received on, on website and shared with council. We presented a revised official plan back in May of 2018. We again circulated it, posted it, met with folks, including the province, local municipalities, developers consultant, as well as members of public who had an interest in meeting with us. Uh, we've received further comments uh, since the release of the May 2018 draft and uh, those comments have been taken in consideration in the revisions that we're recommending uh, in the revised official plan for you today. So just to recap why we plan. So we plan for people, whether they be community members or visitors. Land use planning affects almost every area of life. And you heard a great example today in terms of the attainable housing piece and the, the labor shortage and how planning can um, um, help to address some of those opportunities. It helps set goals about how our community should grow and develop while balancing social, economic, and environmental issues. It balances the interests of individual property owners with the wider interests and objectives of the entire community and the province. Good planning leads to healthy, orderly growth, promotes community interaction, happiness, and social equity, and supports the economy. This draft official plan should be read as a plan for people. Critical elements of this plan, creating healthy communities, enhancing quality of life, fostering a strong local economy, preserving our environment and resource lands, encouraging social interaction, and providing efficient transportation networks are some of the key components and elements of this plan. This plan will be a guiding document for growth for the next 20 years. The new official plan will change over time through amendments to the plan, as the needs and interests of the community change. So it is a living document. Just an official plan recap. So we, through our consultation process over the last two years and a bit, um, we heard a lot of common themes uh, from folks. And, and you'll see those highlighted in the report and they're highlighted on the screen here in terms of these are some opportunities that um, were identified by the community that we need to look at and address through this official plan. Everything from aging demographics, supporting young families, youth and newcomers, looking at our transportation, including active transportation, um, our transit uh, systems, farmland protection, air cultural opportunities, economic changes, challenges affordability, which we heard again this morning, complete communities, climate change, natural environment, our cultural heritage, as well as tourism recreation. These elements have set the foundation in terms of what the plan um, is, is, is before you today. These 11 items are, are, the, are the opportunities that were identified early on in this process that have led to the creation of this plan. There's five main themes in the plan. 
Um, I'm sure you're, you're quite familiar with them with, based on the presentations that we've had uh, to this council. Um, everything from develop gray, live gray, cultivate gray, natural gray, and move gray. So again, those five main themes tie back to those opportunities that I talked about in the previous slide. The plan also contains sections on managing our growth, a section regarding the Niagara Escarpment Plan, and an R tool section. So we have received some further comments uh, since the release of our May 2018 draft. Uh, we've received comments from provincial ministries, some municipalities, uh, the Blue Water District School Board, Niagara Scarma Commission, as well as from Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority. So these are a list of the municipalities and agencies that have provided comments in between the May version and now. Um, so again, we provide links to those comments. We're not going to go through those comments in detail today, um, but hopefully you've had an opportunity to review those comments. Um, majority of the comments were just minor revisions, um, and you'll see that the majority of the changes in this official plan were, were minor. We will highlight some of the key changes that we are proposing. We also received comments uh, from businesses, developers, consultants, and members of the public. Uh, for those that um, identified that they are able to share those comments, we provide links to those. And for, those, for the others, we provide a summary of their comments. And that's all in the report. Again, I'm not going to go through that in detail. Hopefully, you've had an opportunity to review those. What we are going to outline is some of the key changes that we've made to the plan. And as I mentioned, majority of the changes have been, are minor, minor wording changes uh, uh, throughout the plan. Um, and, and you'll see that reflected in the, the revised version. One of the changes in our managing growth is added wording to indicate that some settlement areas are currently or may ex experience a land shortage in the, in the near future to meet growth needs over the next 20 years. So this is important. So we need to do ongoing monitoring and consideration needs to be given to address these issues. So we've added in wording in the official plan to recognize this uh, and we'll be working with those municipalities through future official plan amendments and comprehensive review exercises in order to bring forward uh, um, this, uh, these policies. Randy, before we move uh, forward, I have yeah. a housekeeping uh, thing sure. to do, which is to put the motion on the floor, all right? Okay. Before we go in further, it, it's so far it's been great, but uh, uh, the motion uh, as, as written, uh, motion by Alan Barfoot and seconded by Councillor Burley, that we uh, put the motion uh, on the that was my motion to uh, put it on the floor for oh. discussion. Well, okay, so we'll officialize. Re okay. it's, you're on the floor then. Okay, we good. understand we just have to revise that, that it reflects uh, item C. Okay. We'll have uh, an amended motion that we'll get into in a little bit. Okay, good. Thanks, Ren. Let's turn over to Stephanie to go over the developed gray slides. Welcome, Stephanie. Thanks, Randy. So just to go over a few of the changes that we've made in this most recent draft, um, we've clarified that, clarified that um, the designations for settlement areas in our county official plan are to meet the 20-year projection. However, that doesn't limit the counties and municipality, the county and municipalities to work together to ensure that um, the protection of long-term protection of employment areas are to take place beyond the 20-year time frame. As well, we've clarified from, based on comments from the NEC to if there's any expansion or redesignation to any land use types within the NEC, that this should only take place at the time of the review of the Niagara Escarpment Plan. As well, we've recognized that both a comprehensive review or an updated comprehensive review, review can be supported, provided, uh, uh, can, can be provided to support a newer expansion um, of a settlement area designation. There is further, further clarification under comprehensive reviews. Um, when, if you're looking to, to expand a settlement area um, into an agricultural land use type, this is the, the least desirable option, but if there are no other options available, we provided further information and tests that should be met, such as an agricultural impact assessment study, um, along with wording around minimizing and mitigating adverse impacts to agricultural land use types. We've removed specific legislation details around municipal boundary restructuring and have simply referred to the Municipal Act. When it comes to primary settlement areas, 
We've encouraged new development to be, to be in a form and density which is supportive of future transit needs. Based on the new, uh, so t the town of Blue, Township of Georgian Bluffs has recently acquired the ownership of the sewage treatment plant located at Cobble Beach. So uh, with respect to that, any new subdivision or condomin condominium development within the secondary settlement of East Linton will be required to connect to this service. When it comes to inland lakes and shorelines, expansion of these areas and recreational resort area land use types is not permitted in the special agricultural land use type as per the PPS. And the slide for live gray changes, we've included wording that permanent secondary units will be encouraged in settlement areas instead of temporary garden suites. And when it comes to affordable housing, um, monies received by local municipalities through bonus zoning will be paid into a special account and spent only for community facilities, services, and other matters spe specified by bylaw as per the requirements of the Planning Act. And with respect to general heritage policies, we've included some wording around the counties that the counties and municipalities should should ensure adequate screening for significant built heritage properties and significant cultural heritage landscapes. I'll pass it on to Scott to speak to Cultivate Gray. Thank you. In this regard, one of the changes made in, uh, towards the beginning of Cultivate Gray section in the agricultural, rural, and special agricultural uh, land use types is some clarification on the production of marijuana. Uh, and just to be clear, this has nothing to do with the retail of, of marijuana or, or uh, the potential opt-in or opt-out uh, that municipalities may be looking at in the coming months. Uh, the province clarified that growing marijuana is an agricultural use. Um, in this regard, you could look at it in your agricultural areas. Uh, similarly, some municipalities may choose to also include it in their business parks, um, uh, more like a, a traditional uh, factory or pharmaceutical manufacturing. Um, we've also looked at clarifying some terminology in uh, Cultivate Gray based on some definitions that were already included in the provincial policy statement. <coughs> Um, there were some comments we received, uh, and we received comments on, on both sides of the fence on this one, uh, with respect to expanding uh, development opportunity in rural areas. Uh, more specifically, Georgian Bluffs and Chatsworth, Chatsworth uh, had pointed us to looking at maybe an increased rural density for, for severances in rural areas, uh, as well as maybe even the possibility of, of including uh, uh, rural plans of subdivision back in. Um, in this uh, case, staff aren't recommending new changes be made here uh, for a few reasons. The first is, is uh, uh, we worry about consistency with the provincial policy statement and, and how the province would, would treat this when they come to uh, possibly approve the plan. Um, but we also worry about the potential for conflicts with other rural uses. Uh, we have seen a, a number of conflicts in, in recent years, both with respect to uh, non-farm neighbours and, and farmers, uh, but also perhaps more so uh, with, with, uh, with uh, rural residential uses and, and uh, other resource uses such as aggregates and, and forestry. Uh, that said, we have tried to include uh, a, a bit of flexibility over the policies in the current plan uh, that allow for uh, easier um, ability to implement uh, lot adjustments. Uh, so that might be selling off a portion of your land to your neighbor. Uh, we've relaxed the minimum distance separation provisions with respect to surplus farm dwelling severances. Uh, there's also the ability to sever uh, a farm business such as a grain elevator now from the farm operation, whereas there wasn't in, in our current plan. Uh, and we've also clarified the policies whereby uh, a, a landowner may have a piece of land that, uh, that bridges both a settlement area and a rural area, i.e. they've got part of their land in and part out. So those are, are easier to do now. Um, I would also flag that rural plans of subdivision can be considered uh, via an official plan amendment uh, where they're associated with a specific resource-based recreational use. Uh, so if you had an inland lake and you wanted to develop around that, um, there's certainly provisions in the plan that would consider that with the appropriate technical studies. Um, we, at the behest of the province, we've clarified the minimum distance separation uh, policies uh, further. Also, uh, uh, Township of Southgate pointed out some inconsistencies there, so uh, that's great for them to, uh, to share that with us. Um, we've clarified the list of studies required for new pits and quarries. 
Um, this came from, from uh, some comments received um, to suggest that we need to make sure that, um, uh, that these studies are not only um, consistent with the Aggregate Resources Act, uh, but also meet our local planning documents in terms of municipal and county official plans, as well as the Provincial Policy Statement and the Planning Act. Um, so there's, there's increased emphasis certainly on rehabilitation plans, agricultural impact assessments, and other studies. Um, this section now also gives more autonomy to the municipalities uh, if they want to require additional studies above and beyond what's in the, the county official plan. Uh, we've also clarified our stance both with respect to aggregates, uh, but also with respect to any development uh, uh, application on peer reviews. Uh, there's been a specific section added to, to note that uh, there are times when we have these technical studies peer reviewed at a, a proponent's expense. This had been a practice of the county for many years now, uh, but there was nothing uh, formalizing this practice in the county official plan. Um, one of the other changes that I should flag that we didn't make um, was at the behest of the province who wanted uh, uh, more restrictive policies with respect to the production of, of bedrock and shale resources. Um, as committee may note, we have this mapping included in the draft official plan, um, but it's more of a flagging purposes. For flagging purposes, uh, the province has suggested that we treat this mapping uh, similar to how we treat our current aggregate mapping. Um, staff had concerns with this approach, uh, A, because we haven't verified uh, this mapping similar to the process we went through in the early 2000s with the Aggregate Resource Inventory Master Plan, um, but also with respect to uh, uh, consultation with the public. Although we've consulted with the public to say, hey, we're including this mapping as a flagging purpose, we haven't, uh, we haven't gone back and said, well, listen, it may or may not have impacts on your property uh, if we implemented the provincial approach in this regard. So we are, uh, if you'd like, pushing back a little bit uh, towards some of the provincial comments. Um, we got some excellent comments from the Niagara Scarpment uh, Commission. Uh, they've suggested just clarifying some of the mapping uh, and policies with respect to where we have uh, uh, escarpment natural area in some of our settlement areas. So we've, we've made those changes. And uh, I'll turn, oh, sorry. Uh, with respect to uh, further comments in, in uh, natural gray, um, we had some comments received that, that raised some very valid questions in terms of um, um, sort of the duplicitous uh, wording in, in the county official plan to say that we're targeting our growth in the settlement areas, uh, but we're also protecting our natural features. So where we have a significant uh, woodland in a settlement area, uh, who wins, so to speak? Um, do, we, do we put our growth there because it's a settlement area, or, or do we protect the woodland because it's a significant woodland? Um, so we have added some policies to try to clarify this uh, and to suggest that there are cases whereby uh, if we're looking at natural features in settlement areas, it may be a, an abbreviated process or an abbreviated environmental impact study to note that we do want compact form here, um, but also to note that it's not carte blanche in terms of uh, taking down every tree uh, in a settlement area because there's, there's value to those trees from an environmental uh, and, and social perspective as well. Um, we've clarified for further terminology in this section based on the provincial comments. Uh, we've noted that if someone were to consider a new pit or quarry in a core area, which is our highest area for protection, uh, it could only be done so by official plan amendment. Um, and we also had some excellent comments from the Blue Water District School Board who encouraged us to, to include policies in our park section uh, to note that uh, parks are great near schools, which uh, I can't believe we didn't have that in there earlier. So I'll now turn it over to Randy for, for some more comments. <clears throat> So under the move gray, uh, in terms of recommended revisions, uh, we added a policy for the consideration of providing off-street parking at an alternative site based on comments we received from the school board. We've added in some wording in the active transportation policies to indicate that when developing walkability guidelines, it's important to identify safe pedestrian and cycling routes to schools as well as other community destinations and to promote these routes, including consideration of maintaining them in the winter. We clarified the mitigation measures to be considered for new developments being proposed adjacent to the, the county CP rail corridor. We had received comments from um, uh, a developer as well as the township of Southgate with respect to this. So we've uh, made revisions to the wording in order to address those comments and concerns. We've added in a policy to clarify when servicing capacity is allocated for new draft approvals in accordance with the direction provided in the report. Uh, that was uh, presented to Camille Hole. that was uh, part of the discussion this morning. We clarified some of the source protection plan terminology and policies based on comments from the province. 
And we also clarified that the commercial water taking policies in section 811.4 only applies to water taking associated with water bottling or the selling of water. We also clarified the requirements uh, for the hydrogeological study and the timing for approvals um, and how they relate to the permit to take water process. In the R tool section, we added a policy to identify criteria to be considered for requ requests received to extend draft approval for, for plans of subdivision condominium. This is also a, um, in relation to the report on the servicing allocation that was presented at Camille Hall last, uh, last meeting. So the policy notes that the county will, um, will not support an extension until written support has been received from the municipality. And if a draft plan meets a minimum of four of the 10 criteria identified in that policy, an extension to the draft plan will generally be supported by the county subject to, again, local municipal support. We clarified some of the community improvement plan objectives to align with the community improvement plan program, which we'll be presenting later on today. We added in a policy in the complete application section, noting that the county and municipalities may choose to have studies peer reviewed at a proponent's expense. We added in definitions, as Scott mentioned, um, in the definition section based on comments received from the province and others. And we also added in a section regarding transition provisions for dealing with applications that commence prior to the new official plan coming into effect. And we had our legal review of that uh, particular section as well. In terms of mapping changes, um, so they are in the report, they're on the screen. Uh, we, uh, just to quickly go through some of them, we identify provincial connecting links on Schedule A. We removed all bedrock and shale resource mapping on Appendix E that overlapped with any settlement areas. We deleted Appendix F, which had previously mapped highly vulnerable aquifers and groundwater recharge areas. And instead, we've inserted wording in the official plan to say that we would consider these through a future official plan amendment. It's almost similar to comments back to the bedrock and shale resources. We were uh, a little bit reluctant to add in the mapping uh, and any potential policies uh, until we have had further consultation. Uh, the Spring Mount settlement area boundary has been revised to reflect the boundary approved in the Township of Georgian Bluffs official plan. We added in escarpment natural area designations within secondary settlement areas that are located within the Niagara Escarpment Plan. We changed the, cla the classification of the Hepworth landfill site uh, to now an abandoned landfill site. D4 recommended to clear that site on Appendix A. And we changed the term existing landfill to operating landfill. We revised some of the significant woodland mapping uh, within a couple of developments that have been previously approved. And we changed the functional classification of Gray Road 19 to County Collector on Appendix D. So as I mentioned, uh, since the release of the, the revised draft last week, we've had some uh, further comments uh, from folks. Um, and based on those comments, we're, we're recommending some further revisions. Um, so one, one of those revisions, and, and part of that will be to uh, recommend uh, that the uh, main motion be revised to add in some of these revisions. So the first revision is to add the word significant in front of the term groundwater recharge areas uh, in section 8.11 in the definition section. This is a comment we received from the local source protection staff. Um, we, when we changed the, the wording in the policies and the definition, uh, we forgot to insert the word significant back in. Uh, so there's confusion about the definitions and the policies, so we missed that one. Uh, we also, uh, under section 52212, add in the wording or an updated comprehensive review. This is to be consistent with some of the other sections that we've changed to recognize that a comprehensive review or an updated comprehensive review can be considered for any boundary expansion. And this is a section that we missed. Uh, in the net hectare definition, we're recommending that we add in stormwater ponds. Uh, to exclude these lands as part of the residential density calculation because those won't be able to be developed. Um, so we currently uh, do that right now. So it's just clarifying again the definition to, to reflect that. And then one of the sections that we did add, and these are based on uh, school board comments, was we added a, a, a section under 913. So these, uh, this is a areas... Uh, Items that we want uh, consideration for, for when, there's, uh, when people are submitting new plans of subdivisions and condominiums. And one of those sections that we added in there was confirmation of sufficiency of school accommodation. Um, it wasn't the intent uh, uh, of county staff uh, to confirm that school accommodation and school capacity was required prior to submitting those applications. So what we've done instead is the, the overall intent is to gauge the school boards as early on in the process as possible. 
so that they can plan for any changes required to school capacity and school accommodation. So what we're, we've suggested is adding in a section under 4.4 sub 9, which is our communications engagement section, to say that we would do that. Um, we would engage school boards uh, at even the pre-submission consultation stage um, so that they're aware of, of what may be coming down the pipe, so to speak, from a development perspective. We're also including local municipalities and proponents will be encouraged to engage school boards at early stages of any proposed residential developments. And those are a summary of the uh, further recommended revisions that we're, uh, we're suggesting. Another thing that you'll see in the main motion uh, that we're recommending is the lifting of the two-year moratorium. So uh, some may recall that as part of the changes to the Planning Act last year, um, there was a, a, a two-year moratorium that was put in place by the province for any new official plans that were approved. Um, the, the province provides an option for municipalities to opt out of that two-year moratorium. Um, what we are recommending as part of this motion, if, uh, if it's recommended for adoption, is that um, this two-year moratorium be, be lifted once the province approves the official plan. Uh, that way we can consider official plan amendments, uh, which could even be our own official plan amendments through a housekeeping exercise, as well as just recognizing the community that we will be able to accept official plan amendments. The way we perceive these, these are living documents. Uh, we may not get, uh, we know that uh, there's probably going to be errors in this official plan that we're going to have to revise even after the province approves this plan. Um, so we'll be coming back for likely with a housekeeping amendment. That's just standard, standard procedure. Um, we also want to recognize uh, that we could receive official plan amendments and we would deal with those uh, uh, through the current process through council. So what we're recommending is we lift that two year moratorium. Um, right from the get-go. So next steps. So should Committee of the Whole support adopting the new official plan? A bylaw would be prepared by council, for Council's consideration in October. If Council passes that bylaw, notice of adoption would be circulated to everyone who's been involved in this process. Uh, the adopted plan will be sent to the province for approval. Following the province's approval the, of the new official plan, the decision is final. So um, based on previous discussions, the uh, there is no appeal opportunities uh, once the province approves the new official plan. Any further amendments, revisions could either be made prior to Council's adoption in October, prior to the province's approval, or through a future housekeeping amendment. And before we get into comments and questions, I just want to thank uh, my planning team. Um, so this has been a true team effort right from day one. And uh, it's through the team's efforts that we're to this point here. Um, I think we've tried to be as open and transparent and have as much consultation as possible. Um, early on, we attended things like fall fairs, events. We tried new things and, uh, and staff never balked once in terms of, uh, and, and, and came forward with new ideas as well in terms of, let's, let's uh, see if we can try to come up with a, as most inclusive uh, official plan process as possible. Uh, hopefully we've achieved that. Hopefully we've met your expectations. But I just wanted to thank uh, planning staff uh, because um, it's without them that we wouldn't be here today. Thank you for that. And uh, are there any questions before Randy? Yes, Alan. Well, just uh, a couple of small ones, Randy. Uh, the part in the schools that you explained at the end there, mm -hmm. trying to say this as politically savvy as I can, um, yeah, is this going to be reciprocal? Election. So through the school board part, we've had concerns in the past of, of them starting their process on, on school closures without involving the municipalities. So I hope you've had a good dialogue with them to make sure this, this is both ways then. I yeah. fully support and think this is the right way to do it here, but they gotta come to the table the same way. Yeah. Um, great comment. Um, we've actually, um, over the past, I would say a year or so, um, uh, we've, uh, we've made a more concerted effort of also to engage uh, school boards in conversations um, uh, when new development applications. We've always circulated them on uh, applications as required under the Act. Uh, we're, we're seeing more communication dialogue and it's both ways. Um, in fact, um, there's, there's one uh, development that is being recommended today where there was uh, engagement from the school boards um, early on the process and that's led to some positive changes to that, to that plan. 
Um, we also engage them on uh, de developments that are happening in, in Southgate and trying to um, make sure that they're aware of the timing of when these developments are going to actually be built and residents are going to be occupying. So, so we are seeing uh, more communication uh, both sides. Um, it is a two-way street, there's no doubt about it. And, uh, and definitely um, we are seeing lots of communication uh, back and forth and getting specifically into development, so, which I think is a positive thing. Um, if we can all be involved, not just school boards, but others in terms of uh, early on in the process, the better. And uh, in the end, it's gonna lead to better plans um, um, being coming forward and that we're recommending to, to council. Thanks for that. Any other questions? Councilor Fosper? Thank you, Mr. Warden. Thank you, Randy. Herculean task for everybody. Yes. So I appreciate the information and the answers and all that good stuff. I'm going to try to be as concise as possible. So in the list of prescribed or required commenting agencies, is public health in that or not? Um, typically public health is not. They are on our list. Um, okay, so, so they have? Yes. Because I didn't see any comments. Yes, so they've been involved right from, from day one. Um, Do they have documented comments somewhere that I can read? Uh, I believe they submitted some prior to May 24th. Um, I'll have to check on that. Okay. But they've um, been, um, so just so council's aware, um, we've been working closely with the health unit even before the, the official plan. Um, we've, uh, you'll see a lot of their comments uh, in, in this new official plan in terms of of course, supporting and promoting active transportation and uh, the healthy development checklist. That was, that was formed in partnership with the county and health unit staff. Um, so it's, it's things like that ha that have led to some of the healthy community policies that you'll see in the official plan, active transportation, and other elements. So um, they've been fantastic to work with, and we appreciate their input uh, in this process for sure. Okay, so to that point, I appreciate that you provided a direct link to the source document, which is the comments from the ministry, which is representative of other ministries, I understand? Yes. Okay, correct. so I think that's good that you provided that actual document. In the interest of time, it's always in the interest of time, yes. um, I still have concerns that we are not consistent with the PPS in our treatment of aggregate proposals and the difference between the Aggregate Resources Act and the Planning Act and the required studies. I am told we're still not there. Moving on, we talked about growth numbers and how the iterations of this would catch up with new updated current data on growth projections. Not sure where we're at on that. Yep. Drainage is still a significant concern. You and I talked about how there's some gray area and who owns that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I need to elaborate further on the importance of drainage, stormwater management, climate, weather, the whole nine yards. If anybody's ever driven through the Southgate, you know we have wetlands, which brings me to provincially significant wetlands. So the use of the word significant is significant, and I'm concerned that we're not treating with a high enough priority the protection of wetlands, whether they be significant or not, You've touched on that in the aggregate comments. I'm concerned about the role of the SVCA, what they do, how they do it, and with what expertise, and how they will cease to do it, and who will do it in their stead. Um, peer review is something that I think needs to be more mandated than suggested, more shall than may in many circumstances. Um, natural heritage features. I understand that there are other counties who are treating this differently. There's some variance. I couldn't analyze it for you, but I have a bit of an inkling that maybe that needs some more consideration. Um, on your PowerPoint, your second to last slide was next steps. Can we go back to that? I didn't see next steps in your staff report. And so just to be clear, so we, first of all, you, you, I'm not prepared to approve this today. I had the last update three business days ago. I can't absorb of information that fast. And this is too big. So we send this to the province. You've already said that you're kind of pushing back on some of the comments from the province. 
do we not get what the province gives us back again? Because my concern is that this council is going to approve this and we're done. So I'm not all right with that. Yes, Please. go ahead, Ron. Yeah, so a um, couple things on that. Um, uh, it's, with an official plan, we're never done. Um, it's a living document. Um, we'll find, no doubt, some changes that will be re likely required even after the province approves the plan. As I mentioned, we can deal with that through housekeeping amendments in the future. Uh, in terms of once it's adopted by council, we send it on to the province for approval. Um, the process that we've dealt with in the past is that it's an iterative process. It's a back and forth between the province and the county in terms of any modifications that they'll be recommending. What we've heard, because the, the, there's no appeal mechanism, um, there even, there's going to be even greater sensitivity in terms of what modifications they're going to be um, recommending or suggesting without consultation with the county at least. Um, so that's something that um, um, through staff discussions we've heard. Um, so we will, uh, we're hopeful that we will see a list of any modifications and that we'll be able to provide opportunity for comment and feedback prior to them actually approving those modifications. So that's a, um, what we're hoping through that process. If we even identify any changes that we missed, um, we've, we've already uh, highlighted four today. Um, we can recommend those as modifications to the province. It's up to them if they want to choose to, to accept those. Uh, but even in, in between adoption and approval, we still have opportunities to provide comments and feedback to the province if there's something that we missed or we got wrong. Um, so that's, uh, those are some, I guess, comments in terms of uh, the process. But like I said, it's, it's a living document. It, it needs to be living because, um, because things change. Um, and, and so that's why there's, there is the amendment process that uh, is always an option to us after the fact. And that's a, another reason why we're lifting the two, or recommending we lift the two-year moratorium. All right, I think you've covered uh, a lot of the different options available and appreciate uh, Councillor Fosbrook's input. If I may, Mr. Warden, I just want to clarify one last point. So what you're saying then is, and I'm going to use the analogy of when a council approves a zoning bylaw amendment, for example, or, or um, up until the point that they've actually approved it that somebody can comment. Is that what you're saying? So we're gonna send this to the province and until they finally approve it, they, anybody can still submit comments? Is that what you're saying? That's absolutely correct. Okay. And what's that potential time frame? So we asked that question to the province just to uh, get an idea or a sense of, of how long this could take. There is, uh, under the changes that were made in the, the Planning Act in last year, um, they are, um, there's a hard, time frame in terms of to issue approvals, which is 210 days. Um, they indicated that they can't provide anything further outside of that, but uh, the 210 days, say if it was adopted on October 11th, I think it was May something, 2019, uh, is when they would have to issue a decision. Um, so that gives us a little bit of certainty, I guess, in terms of uh, that within 210 days, there'll be a, some form of decision. Um, we're hopeful that because we've involved the province right from, again, day one, uh, we feel that we're very, very close in terms of any suggested revisions and modifications that we've made to this official plan. We're hopeful that it can be quicker than that. I, I can't say that, that it's going to be the case, but we're very hopeful that uh, it'll be a fairly quick turnaround from adoption to final approval. Thanks for that. Anybody else want to make any comments? Yes, just if I could, and just a couple of real s specific items there that I'm trying to figure out where they're at. There was comments in there about secondary units in the urban area. Secondary units in the rural area are going to be allowed? Go ahead, Randy. Through you, Mr. Warden. Yes, um, they are going to be allowed. Um, we... Um, on a permanent basis? Uh, not... No, I don't think on a permanent basis. We are recommending that in, in settlement areas that secondary units be um, something that we want municipalities to implement. Uh, 
uh, in the rural areas, we're, we're still providing some flexibility in terms of uh, what municipalities wish to do. Some municipalities have uh, implemented um, secondary units in their zoning bylaws, some have not. And so to recognize that, we provide a bit more flexibility in the rural areas. Okay. And then on the rural severances, you've got a 10 acre piece of property. The individual is, you know, we're, we keep talking about in the urban areas about density levels. In that 10 acres, we're still in the, in the official plan um, required of a two acre property, you know, to be able to service. That's right. But we know we have many lots out there that are at 10 acres. I I'm missing whether severing that 10 acres in a rural lot to maximize the intensity in rural lot creation. Are we going to allow a 10 acre parcel to be split in two or even split in five? Ahead, Mr. Warden, uh, yes, so the policies, um, as long as we're uh, a lot being created is, is achieving that two hectare minimum, um, uh, a severance could still occur within a 10 acre parcel subject to the density being met. So if for, um, currently we allow for um, uh, two plus the retained, so three essentially uh, within 40, 40 hectares of the original lot concession, um, so if there's, um, for example, two today, um, you could split that 10 acres because then it's one more plus the retained maximum three. So you could still split the 10 acres, for example, in half as long as it is under the current maximum density uh, in recognizing the official plan. So we really haven't changed anything on rural densities. Intensification, uh, sorry, intensification. That's correct. We're not recommending that at this stage. So we can make that amendment in the bylaw when it comes forward on October the 11th. <laughs> that is, uh, if that's the desire of council, that's uh, of course up to council. I look forward to Chatsworth making that motion. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. So um, it's been a good good discussion. So lunch is uh, waiting. Yes. So. Uh, yeah. Specific um, uh, issues to address, uh, Mr. Warden, but just to say thanks uh, and congratulations. Uh, to the planning staff, right. what we have here is the result of an awful lot of work, and I think that these folks could probably give lessons on public consultation, uh, quite frankly. I, I just want to acknowledge uh, you. your work, and, and uh, it's been a pleasure, uh, absolutely, uh, Town of Hanover, working with you on the official plan. Thank you. And, uh, well, words can't express everybody's appreciation, and I think you're, if you uh, had... Uh, stars you would get many many gold stars you and your team so i i think you've reinvented the wheel here and how to do it so um and we can satisfy some some little issues as we move forward and i like the flexibility so i think we have to move on to bring forward this uh, and I, again thank you very much for that thank you you've exceeded expectations thank you thanks yes uh, Councilor pringle thank you mr warden uh, the process then randy just for clarification would be any, uh, any changes coming forward would have to happen before the final passing in October. Yeah, so um, if, if council wishes to make any revisions prior to uh, officially adopting it, um, what I would recommend is that that be done prior to the bylaw being adopted on, um, we're suggesting on October 11th if this motion passes. Um, and again, outside of that, if we recognize that there's something that we missed, um, if we find something that uh, uh, is, is glaringly, oh, we, we forgot that, um, we can make a suggestion to the province, but my suggestion would be if there's any changes that you're, you're uh, going to be requesting or recommending, that, that, be, uh, that a notice of motion, I guess, would be introduced today to be considered, I guess, on the October 11th, and I'd be looking to the clerk staff for clarification on that process. Um, so then the, the revision could be considered prior to adopting the bylaw, which would come forward on October 11th. Okay, thank, thanks for that. So we have a motion that I've got to put on the floor, which is the motion uh, be revised, the main motion be revised to add. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. I just- Putting a motion on the floor. No, I'm not putting a motion on the floor. I have a question. To what? What is my question? Yes. So, to the comment about will this require a notice of motion, 
I think I'd like an answer to that. So uh, does this mean that if somebody wants to put a motion on the floor to amend any portion of this proposed draft, that that requires a notice of motion? Because that would mean you have to do it today in order to address it on the 11th. And if you fail to do it today, then you can't address it until after the 11th, and then the horse has left the barn. Please. Okay. Let's let's work on that. So we're going to break now for lunch, and uh, can, uh, Randy can and the CEO can figure that one out. Sure. Oh, right now, on the inputs. Okay. So we'll break for lunch, and then at one o'clock we have the grand opening, and then we'll come back and move to have lunch. Um, Mr. Warden, how long are we breaking for lunch? I have an AMO meeting, and I have to be in Toronto by four. Uh, <laughs> you have to guide yourself accordingly. Um, um, well, I would like to hear the yep. CIP, so I kind of would like well, uh, you know, and seeing not. Okay. You should be, uh, when we book these meetings, you're supposed to be here until 4 o'clock, so. I know I have an important AMO meeting, too. I understand, but I'm just saying, so anything less than 4 o'clock is, you know, your option. I understand you enable. I understand Mayor McQueen on, on, on his AMO thing. But we're, we're breaking for lunch. All right, and then we'll do the opening ceremonies, the cutting of the ribbon, and uh, begin the tours. And again, thank you. We'll reconvene uh, after, after the grand opening. Thank you very much. Thank you.